Hello out there in Radio Land. We invite you to reminisce for a while this afternoon as we present Those Were the Days, brought to you with fond memories by Northwest Federal Savings and Loan Association, by Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and by Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. This is Chuck Shaden with another in our series of programs designed to bridge the sound gap between yesterday and today. Today is Saturday, June the 2nd, 1979. Today we continue our special presentation of a complete broadcast day from 1939. It's part five in our look at a day in history, a day in the life of radio station WJSV in Washington, D.C. It's Thursday, September 21st, 1939, and today we present WJSV's late afternoon programming from 4 o'clock until 6.30. We're going to listen for a baseball, baseball game between the Washington Senators and the Cleveland Indians, We'll have sports news, world news, music, Amos and Andy, and the Parker family. It'll be another interesting afternoon stroll down Kilocycle Lane. Helping us put that special 40-year-old day into perspective is Fred McDonald, professor of history at Northeastern Illinois University and author of the forthcoming book on radio programming entitled Don't Touch That Dial. It'll be a good afternoon, gang, so stick around and don't touch that dial. Stay with us. It all begins right after this word for Northwest Federal Savings. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. At Northwest Federal, we have more ways for you to save. If you'd like to invest but not speculate, a Northwest Federal Savings Certificate is the perfect solution. An insured, guaranteed savings certificate from Northwest Federal lets you take advantage of top interest rates when you invest a required amount of savings for a specified period of time. Annual interest rates range from 5 and 3 quarters to 8%. Federal regulations require a substantial interest penalty for early withdrawal. Remember, no other bank or savings and loan offers you a higher interest rate than Northwest Federal Savings. It's the highest rate allowed by law, one quarter of a percent more than any commercial bank. Stop by any Northwest Federal Savings Center for complete details on all our savings plans. It's just one more example of how Northwest Federal does more for you. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. And we've got a good time for you tonight at Northwest Federal Savings. We have uh, our memory movies resuming now after the uh, theatrical troupe and their musicals for the last three weekends. So tonight we have a double feature for you. From 1946, it's Blondie's Lucky Day with Penny Singleton and Arthur Lake. Plus we have Ellery Queen, Master Detective from 1940 with Ralph Bellamy as Ellery Queen. It's a very good film. Uh, both of them are a real good double feature. Uh, the films will be shown tonight at Northwest Federal Savings Irving Park Community Center Auditorium at 4901 Irving Park Road in Chicago. Doors open at 7.30. Our films will begin at uh, 8 o'clock. Donation is $1.25 per person with all proceeds being donated to recognized charities. So uh, we'll start off with Blondie's Lucky Day. That'll roll at 8 o'clock. That runs about 69 minutes, so a little bit after... Nine is when Ellery Queen, Master Detective, will be on the scene. I hope you'll join us. We'll be there tonight, and we hope that you will join uh, all of us to see a good double feature, Blondie's Lucky Day plus Ellery Queen, Master Detective. Well, as we continue now with our Those Were the Days look at this uh, complete broadcast day from 1939, our guest in the studio, Fred McDonald. Uh, Fred, you've been with us all these weeks so far as we've uh, listen to this day from uh, the station in Washington, D.C., from their sign-on with uh, Arthur Godfrey in the morning program through all of the soap operas. Uh, we had two weeks, basically, of some of the daytime dramas, and last week, of course, we had the uh, uh, Roosevelt speech before the special session of Congress and uh, Scattergood Baines. Today, we're into the late afternoon of uh, this radio station, and we have a baseball game joined in progress. It was delayed no doubt, because of the um, uh, the Roosevelt speech. But you were mentioning something to me last week that uh, this was not the uh, the game of the month, so to speak, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think this game is more a reflection of contractual arrangements that uh, WJSV had with the uh, Washington Ball Club. Undoubtedly, WJSV was the radio station which played, uh, which uh, broadcast the home games and maybe even the away games of the Washington Senators baseball team. The reason it's not the game of the week is the sense that the baseball season was about a week and a half, maybe two weeks from the end here in late September of 1939, 
And the game we're going to see pits the Cleveland Indians, who were 20 and a half games out of first place, against the Washington team, which was 38 and a half games out of uh, first place. So it was like a neck and neck race to see who's going to be in the bottom. Huh? Uh, yes, <laughs> it, it was the also rans, that's for sure. Uh-huh. Well, is this a, uh, would you say that? Uh, we were a week and a half away from the World Series, you're saying, right? Right. On about the 21st of, of September? About week two, right. Now, this is being broadcast from Griffith Stadium. Right. And uh, the game is being joined in progress at the bottom of the fourth inning. Then there's no score up to this point. So we really haven't missed anything. Well, as a true <laughs> baseball fan would say you've missed four innings or three innings of exciting uh, defensive play. But uh, it's an interesting... This uh, The Washington team in the teens and the 20s was fairly formidable, but in the 30s, 40s, 50s, it was the doormat team, essentially, of the American League. Then they left Griffith Stadium, and their uh, franchise was shifted to Minnesota, and something happened up there in the cooler weather, I guess, uh, because in Minnesota, the Minnesota Twins have become a a formidable force Mm -hmm. uh, in American League baseball. It must be the weather, the water. Could have been something like this. This is actually the last game of the season, as far as these two teams are concerned, or at least as far as the Washington Senators are concerned. It's a ladies' day out at Griffith Stadium, and we're going to join them now. So we take you back 40 years now to September 21st of 1939. It's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. We're tuned to radio station WJSV, the CBS-owned and operated station in in our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. You're going to hear some commercials here for Wheaties and for Miller's Market, believe it or not, and um, a few other little things. Let's uh, let it speak for itself as we take you back to... um, Baseball. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Harry McTighe speaking to you from our radio booth at Top Griffith Stadium, where this afternoon, for the remainder of the afternoon, we're going to bring you a play-by-play broadcast of the final game of the season between the Cleveland Indians and the Washington Senators. The first half of the fourth inning just concluded. There's no score in the ball game. And before the last half of the fourth inning gets underway, we're going to give you the lineups and then turn you over to your Wheaties play-by-play announcer, Walter Johnson. The lineup for the Cleveland Indians finds Lou Boudreau at shortstop, Roy Weatherly in left field, Ben Chapman in center field, Sammy Hale at second base, Bruce Campbell in right field, Ken Keltner at third base, Oscar Grimes at first base, Raleigh Hensley catch, and Al Milner, a left-hander, on the mound. The lineup for Washington, Eddie Lee at second base, Quick at shortstop, Pitko, right field, right, left field, Gelbert, third base, Vernon, first base, Gideon, center field, Farrell, catch, and Bass, a right-hander on the mound. Bass is up from Chattanooga, the Southern Association, with the Senators, and down there he won about 19 ball games and lost seven. We've seen only three hits in the ball game, Cleveland having two, a single by Lou Boudreau in the first inning and a single by Raleigh Hensley in the second. Washington has only one base hit, that an empty hit by Eddie Lee. End of the last half of the fourth inning, and Pitko, the right fielder, right-hand batter's coming up, and here is Walter Johnson. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going into the last of the fourth. No score in this ball game. Pitko, the right fielder, is up. Bats right-handed. Here comes the first pitch. He swings and fouls it back. Pitko walked his first time up. Al Melnar, left-hander, pitching out there for the Cleveland Indians, is allowed only one hit, an infield single. Here comes the next pitch. It's a fastball. It's outside, one and one. He's allowed one single and one walk. Bass, on the other hand, is allowed two hits and five walks. A little bit wild. Here comes the next pitch. And it's a little bit high. Hensley's kicking on that pitch. It's two and one on Pitko. Here comes the next pitch. And it's high and inside. Three and one's a count now. Notice starts his wind up again. Here it comes. He swings and misses. Pitko had a good cut at that ball, but missed. And the count three and two. Last half the fourth. Nobody out. Nobody on. Here comes the next pitch. 
He swings, hit the fly, going into right field. Bruce Campbell is coming over there. He's under it, waiting. And he's out. Pitco flies out to Camel in right field for the first out. Taft right comes up now. Taft playing left field, bat left-handed. Lucky Harris has most of his right-handers in there. That young kid in. First pitch is too high, ball one. Young combination down there, second and short, leap and quick. They did a nice piece of work in that first inning and in making a double play. Here comes the next pitch, he swings and fouls it back. It's one and one. Woodrow single to lead off. Weatherly hit one down, second base, leap. Made a nice play on it, hustled over to quick. It's and Woodrow was forced and Leap hustled that ball over to Vernon for a double play. Starting this ball game, here comes the next pitch. It's high and outside. It's two and one. This is ladies' day out here. Quite a few of the fair sex out. Here comes the next pitch. You swing, hit the high fly right straight up. Back of home plate. Hendley's under that ball. And he catches it right underneath us here. For the second out. Two men out now. And Charlie Gilbert comes up. Charlie bats right-handed. He's down there on third base in place of Buddy Lewis this afternoon. This has developed into a pitcher's battle out there so far. Here comes the first pitch on Gilbert's is high and outside. Ball one. Two men out now. Here comes the next pitch. And it's a little bit too high. Ball two. Two nothing. Nona starts his wind up again. Here it comes. And it's ball three. That's a little bit too low. Three nothing on Charlie Gilbert. Miller starts his wind up. Here comes the pitch, and it's right down there for strike one. Three and one. Miller starts his wind up again. Here it comes, and it's strike two. It took that inside corner. Three and two. Starts his wind up again. Here it comes. He swings, hits the fly, going into right field. Camel's going over the wheel there near the line. It's up there. It hits that against that wall, bounce out in there. Gilbert pulls up at second base with a two-base hit. That ball was right down that right field line, hit up on the wall. And Bruce Camel took it on the top, tossed it back into second base. Charlie Gilbert pulled up. Standing at second base with a two-base hit. And Vernon, the first baseman, comes up now. Vernon bats left-handed. Here comes the first pitch on Vernon. It's a little bit low and inside. Ball one. <laughs> Not much of a breeze out here, just Slight breeze blowing over towards right field. Here comes the next pitch. He swings and fouls it back. It's one and one. Milner has another ball out there now. Steps on there, starts to stretch. Here comes the pitch, and it's a little bit too low. It's a curve ball. Two and one. Milner gets the sign. He's watching Charlie Gilbert back there on second. Starts to stretch. Here comes the pitch, and it's strike two. That cut, took that outside corner. Vernon didn't like that, and neither did the ladies in the stand. They're giving the umpire a lot of booze down there. It's two and two. Two men out. 
Last half the fourth, no score. Here comes the next pitch. He swings and fouls one down in left field stand. Taken by a lone spectator down there. He had no competition, so he just took his time to get that ball. Milner has another ball. Steps on there. Here comes the pitch. He swings and fouls one right straight back at us here. Hendley comes back, but he can't get it. Ball hits the screen back here. So the umpire tosses out another ball to Milner, and the count remains two and two. Hasn't been much hitting in this ball game. Been a little bit quiet. Here comes the next pitch. He swings, hits the ground ball back to the second base. Sammy Hill comes up with there's a play to first, and he's out. That's a close play down there. Vernon hit a roller just past Milnar. He reached for it, but couldn't quite touch it. Sammy Hill hustled in and got it over to first. And the side's retired with no runs. One hit. No errors, and one man left to score at the end of four innings. Nothing, nothing. And Bass, the boy just up from Chattanooga, walks out on the mound, starts tossing a few to Rick Farrell. Bass mixes them up pretty well down there. Has a fairly good fastball. He's supposed to have a, a good knuckler. Looks like he has a pretty fair curve. He's just been a little bit wild. But apparently he has something on that ball. He gets, He's had three and two on most of the batters. And with usually when they get a pitcher where he's got to come down in there to him, they're get a hold of that ball, but they're hitting a little bit late, hitting that, those right-handers, hitting that ball off the right field. He's all warmed up and good roll. Shortstop comes up. Here comes the first pitch, and it's strike one, a fast ball right down there. Good roll single his first time up. Bass takes his wind up again. Here comes the pitch, and it's one of those knucklers, a little bit too low, and it's one and one. Takes his wind up, here comes the pitch, he swings and hits one right back. Bass takes it on a big hop, tosses to Vernon, and Woodrow is out. <laughs> one man out, and Roy Weatherly, left fielder comes up, he bats left-handed. Bass takes his wind up, here comes the pitch, and that's a knuckle that's a little bit outside. Like we may have two knuckleball artists on this ball club. That's Leonard and Bass. Here comes the next pitch. He swings at the fly going into left center. Get it. Get in is coming in. Tap right is coming in. Right calls for it and makes the catch. Right out there in front of Get in. In short left center. And we have two men out. Then Chapman comes up now. Then it's been up twice. Bass takes his wind up. Here comes the pitch. And it's a curve ball. Came right over there for strike one. Starts his wind up again. Here it comes. And that's, this time it's a knuckler that took that inside corner. Strike two. Starts his wind up again. Here it comes. He swings at the fly going into center field. Get in is standing there waiting. And he has it. Chapman flies out to get in, in right center, retiring aside. No runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. Three up and three down. And for the first time in the ball game, Bass has 
Set the Indians down in order. So the score going into last of the fifth is still nothing, nothing. Young Bass has showed us a little of everything out there. I don't know what he uses those pitchers to It's just about right that football pitchers used to be. They were a few real outstanding football pitchers. And a lot of the other boys were trying to throw that spitter, but they'd get in trouble every once in a while and attempt to come in there with a spitter. There wouldn't be anything on them. Somebody would crack it on them. Dutch Leonard gets himself in trouble. He uses that knuckler. And I don't know what this boy depends upon when he gets out there in a tight spot. But anyway, we he showed us a pretty good knuckler, pretty fair curve ball, and... Fairly good fastball. Anyway, those Cleveland Indians haven't done a whole lot up the plate. Well, he, Miller's all warmed up now, and Big Gideon comes up, center fielder, bats right-handed. Miller starts his wind-up. Here comes the pitch, and he tried to bunt that ball down the third baseline, but it goes foul. This Gideon is a big, tall boy, but he runs very well. He's formerly uh, with the Michigan University. And he looks pretty good out there. Here comes the next pitch. And it's a little bit inside. Ball one, one and one. Miller takes his wind up. Here comes the pitch. He swings, hits a high fly right up into the infield. Woodrow is going back, calls for it, and he has it. Gideon flies out to Woodrow in back of shortstop for the first out. One man out now, and Rick Farrell comes up. Farrell's catching this ball game. Pretty good man in there with those young pitchers, or especially the newcomers, whether they're young or not. First pitch is right down in there, strike one. That's called a fast one. Miller starts his wind up. Here comes the pitch. He swings at the fly ball, going into center field. Chapman is going back. He's on it and has it. Farrell lines out to Chapman in center field for the second out. And Bass comes up now. Not bald, is he, Warren? Took his cap off there. <laughs> Tell me for a bat, he's got quite a hook. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good, Warren. Pretty good. Well, he's getting a nice hand from these legs. <laughs> <laughs> Miller takes his wind up. Here comes the pitch. He swings on the first one, hits the fly ball, going into right field. Bruce Campbell is out there waiting, and he has it. Bass flies out to Camel in right field. Retiring aside with no runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. Three up and three down. And the score at the end of five innings still nothing, nothing. No score in this ball game. This thing has developed into a battle between Lefty Milner and Mr. Bass. And we're going to break away from the uh, the action out there at uh, Washington, D.C., at Griffith Stadium for a moment to identify ourselves, do a little business here. I'm Chuck Shade, and this is our Those Were the Days program from WNIB Chicago at FM 97. And just in case you just tuned in a little while ago and you're rolling your radio dial across the FM band and you all of a sudden hear the baseball game and you said, what? I, what, is it, what is baseball game doing on FM? And you're sitting there trying to figure out where that game came from or what was happening. This is a game between the Cleveland Indians and the Washington Senators uh, from Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C. on the last day of the season, last game of the season from September 21st of 1939. Now you know where you are. This is uh, uh, kind of an interesting game. Uh, as Fred McDonald said before, it um, was not necessarily the uh, the two hottest teams in the in the league, but uh, nevertheless, they were uh, they were there. Fred, uh, 
How does this uh, announcer here uh, stack up to uh, Vince Lloyd or Lou Boudreau or Jack Brickhouse or Mel yeah. Allen or any of them? Or uh, uh, Harry Carey. Uh, yeah. I, I think that the uh, the monotone uh, quality of the 1939 announcer is rather striking compared to... Uh, to almost anybody who's on the contemporary scene, the announcers now are, are much more energetic. Uh, uh, somebody like Boudreau, who ironically is playing shortstop in this game we're mm -hmm. listening to in 39, uh, brings a, a great expertise to it and an analysis uh, to, to what's going on in the game. And uh, somebody like Harry Carey brings a fantastic, you know, effervescent personality, which in many cases, uh, when uh, the White Sox are having a dismal season, uh, helps the White Sox <laughs> along uh, as if he were a tenth player on the team. So I don't think there's a much favorable comparison to be made with the voice of the Washington Senators in 1939 and, and what's uh, around today. You know, I remember uh, one of the mm. great sportscasters, one of the Cubs uh, announcers uh, from years ago, not not that many years ago, not to 1939, but into the 40s, was a, a fellow who used to broadcast the games on WIND by the name of Burke Wilson. And, uh, of course, Bob Elson broadcast the Cubs and the Sox and Jack Brickhouse and uh, so many others uh, in the uh, Chicago area. So uh, there's some nostalgia here for uh, listeners of baseball games, and I hope that you're finding this kind of an interesting look back uh, at a baseball game in progress. You know, sometimes they, they uh, used to broadcast a game. They would re, uh, recreate a game from the wire services. The ticker line would be coming into the studio, and the announcer and the sound effects man would work like crazy, and they would be broadcasting a game that was being played in another city someplace, and they'd have the crowd noises and the bat hitting the ball and the cheers and the whole thing, and he'd be doing the play-by-play. -play. He'd make up all of the action just from the terse uh, language that would come off the ticker <coughs> tape. And Bob Elson had said that he's, he's done that already. Now, I grew up in Los Angeles where they didn't have Major League Baseball at the time, um, not until the late 50s, but... Uh, they used to do a lot of recreating of ball games, and there would be a bat suspended by a, a string from the ceiling, so whenever the, the, there was a hit, the, guy, the announcer would hit it with a stick, and it sounded like a ball was going <laughs> out there. But what was interesting, too, is when there would be an off day, say on a Monday, when there's no major league game on to, to recreate, they would go back to, say, the fourth game of the 1934 World Series, mm -hmm. and with the information, uh, uh, you could recreate the game. And, of course, nobody was there to say if uh, if so-and-so flied out on a three-and-two pitch or on the first ball that was pitched to him. <laughs> so if you wanted to put a whole game within an hour, you could have everybody hitting in the first pitch. And you wouldn't really know if that's how it went or not. But Well, you know what they would do today if they were doing something like that? They'd take the videotapes. It's for TV now. They could even do this. The videotapes of all of the games that were played in a week, and they'd make a composite game. <laughs> and speed it up. <laughs> speed it up <laughs> and interrupt it very often for commercials, which is what we're doing right now on WNIB Chicago. If you're an old-time radio fan, you're invited to visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. You'll be amazed at the supply of new things to bring back the old times and old things to provide more good times. Hundreds of recordings of the fabulous old-time radio shows are available on cassette, 8-track tape, and LP records. You can get War of the Worlds, Abbott and Costello's Who's on First, Jack Benny, Fibber McGee and Molly, Amos and Andy, Suspense, Lights Out, Inner Sanctum, I Love a Mystery, and much more. Plus, we have big band, soundtrack, and personality recordings, movie posters and photographs, and a fabulous collection of books and magazines about radio, television, movies, and the comics. It's all there, and it's waiting for you at Metro Golden Memories, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 till 5, Saturday till 7.30. We're open right now on Sundays from noon to 5. If you can remember it, you can probably find it at Metro Golden Memories, 5941 West Irving Park Road in Chicago. And you can use your Visa or Master Charge at the MGM shop. If you're coming to the movie tonight, you can stop by uh, ahead of time and snoop around at the old MGM shop. I mean, if you're going to the movie at Northwest Federal, the film is uh, Blondie's Lucky Day plus Ellery Queen Master Detective, a good double feature. film starts at 8 o'clock and the doors open at 7.30 and uh, the MGM shop is open until 7.30 so you can make a nice uh, segue and get from the one to the other and have a good, uh, good old nostalgic evening after a nice nostalgic uh, afternoon here listening to us. I'm Chuck Shade, and Fred McDonald is here, as he has been the last four weeks. 
as we listen in to these sounds from a broadcast day, September 21st of 1939. We'll take you back now to Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C., as we continue the play-by-play -play coverage of the game between the Washington Senators and the Cleveland Indians. Well, uh, Harry, you have something over there? Yeah, I have some scores, Walter. Right, in the American League this afternoon, the New York Yankees beat out the Chicago White Sox 5-2. to two. The Yanks, 5 runs, 10 hits, no error. Chicago, 2 runs, 8 hits, 1 error. Boston defeated St. Louis 6-2. to two. Boston, 6 runs, 9 hits, no error. St. Louis, 2 runs, 7 hits, 1 error. And Detroit beat Philadelphia 7-6. to six. The Tigers, 7 runs, 11 hits, 2 errors. Philadelphia, 6 runs, 10 hits, and 3 errors. The National League, the Pirates beat the Boston Bees in the first game of a doubleheader, 6-4. Six, six runs, eight hits, one error for Pittsburgh, four runs, 12 hits, two errors for Boston. Well, we're moving into the first half of the sixth. There's still no score in the ball game, and as Walter told you, it's somewhat of a pitching duel between Bass and Al Milner. Bass, a big right-hander, Milner, a big left-hander. Sammy Hale's leading off now. In comes the first pitch, and he fouls it back into the stands. The upper tier of the grandstand for strike one. Hales up for the third time, walked in the first inning and fouled out to Vernon in the third. You fans out around Miller's Market at 2135 4th Street Northeast can be on the lookout for the big train tonight, but he'll be out there. Here's the next one in, and Sammy Hale hits a slow ground ball down to second base. Eddie Lee comes in, feels the ball, gets it to Vernon, and Hale goes out. Grounding out second to first for out number one. That brings Bruce Campbell, right fielder, left-hand batter up. Fly to center field in the first and to left field in the third. Two hits in the ball game so far for Cleveland. Bass is ready. Here's the pitch coming in, and Campbell swings on it, lines it right down the foul line in left field. It's going over against the box seats. He's rounded first on his way to second, makes the turn at second, but holds up when Taft right fields the ball and relays it into Hal Quick. Campbell was swinging on that ball and laced it right down the line. It's good for two bases. That puts him on second base, one out, and Kelton, a third baseman, a right-hand batter coming up. He flied to center field and fouled out to Jim Verna. Bass takes a stretch, looks back at second base, and comes to pitch to Kelton. Outside low in the dirt. Rick Farrell had to dig that one out. Ball one as it counts. Here's the next pitch coming into Keltna. And he swings, falls it back against the stands. One and one is a count. Tomorrow's an off day here at Griffith Stadium. No ball game. The New York Yankees move in for game, a single game Saturday afternoon and another Sunday afternoon. New ball's out in the hands of Bass. He takes a stretch. Here's the pitch coming in. Low inside. Ball two. Two and one is a count now on Ken Keltna. Bass looks into Rick Farrell, gets a signal, takes a stretch, looks back at second base. Here's the next one coming in. Keltner fouls that one back into the screen. Two and two is a count. Washington infield is Vernon at first, Eddie Leap at second base, Hal Quick is at shortstop, Charlie Gilbert's at third. The outfield is Taft right in left, El Gideon in center, and Alex Pitko in right. Two and two is the count on Ken Keltner. Bass is ready. Here's the pitch coming in. And Keltner swings on it, hits it out into left field. Way back, way back. And Taft right makes a beautiful catch just in front of the wall. Turns and hustles that ball in to Charlie Gilbert at third base. That was a nice catch by Taft right. A few more feet of distance on that ball. And Wright couldn't have gotten his hands on it. He made the catch and then rolled against the wall out there, but he held on to it. So it's two away. Campbell still on second base, and Oscar Grimes, first baseman, a right-hand batter coming up. He flied to Pitko on right field in the second, and he walked in the fourth. Bass has given up five walks in the game. Standing off the rubber, rubbing the ball off. Walks on, gets the signal, takes the stretch. Look back at second, here comes the pitch into Grimes. Right across that outside corner for a call strike. It's 
Strike one on Grimes. First half of the six, no score. Bass is ready for the next pitch, and it comes. And Grimes lifts it high in the air. It's going into short center field. Leap quick, and Gideon all after the ball. Gideon calls for it, makes the catch. Route number three to retire the side. No runs, one hit, no errors, and one runner left on base. So at the end of the first half of the six, the score still reads Cleaver nothing and Washington nothing. Don't forget, you fans around Miller's Market at 2135 4th Street Northeast, Walter Johnson will be out there tonight for a personal appearance. And tomorrow night at the Calvert Market, 1862 Columbia Road Northwest. 7.30 to 9 at Miller's Market, 7.30 to 9 tomorrow night at the Calvert Market at 1862 Columbia Road Northwest. Last half of the six coming up now. The leadoff man will be Eddie Lee. Where's McTagg gonna be, Warren? <laughs> All that time. In the dog house. <laughs> no, uh, Walter, I I got lost last night. <laughs> I've got the right directions tonight, though. I know where 2135 4th Street Northeast is, because I've been out there before. I got lost last night, too, Harry, but I made it. <laughs> Now into the last half of the six. Eddie leads second baseman. A right hand batters up. The first pitch comes in high for ball one. Leap struck out in the first inning and beat out an infield hit in the third. Milner's thoughts is wind up. Here's the next one coming in. Eddie takes a curve ball for a call strike to even the count one and one. Oscar Grimes at first base for Cleveland. Hale at second. Boudreaux at short. Kelton at third. Here's the next one coming in. And it's high for ball two, two and one. The Cleveland outfield is Weatherly in left, Chapman in center, and Campbell in right. Al Milner's the pitcher, and Raleigh Hensley's the catcher. Milner goes into a wind-up. Here's the next pitch coming in. And Eddie Leaf swings on and hits one over the head of Kent Kelton out into left field. It's a base hit. Weatherly feels it on the ground, gets the throw into Boudreaux. And Eddie Leaf is on first base with a single, his second hit of the afternoon. Washington has only three hits in the ball game, and Leap has two of the three. Charlie Gilbert has the other. That double off the right field wall of the court. So we have a runner on first base. Nobody out, and up comes Hal Quick, shortstop. Right hand batter. He's grounded out two times. He's been up. Here's the first one coming in. Hal takes it. It's low. Ball one. Ball one on Quick. Milner takes a stretch, a look at first base. Here's the next pitch coming in. Quick swings on it, hits it out into right field. It has Campbell on the move. He goes back, pulls the ball down, then gets his throw in to Hale at second base. Now quick lining to Bruce Campbell in right field. Drove Bruce back about 12 or 14 feet to make that catch. So we have one out, runner still on first, and Alec Pitko, right fielder, Right hand batters up. He walks in the first and he flies to right field in the fourth. No score, the last half of the sixth. Nolan takes a stretch. Here's the first pitch coming in. Pitko swings and misses. Strike one. There's a toss over to Oscar Grimes at first base. Eddie Lee back in plenty of time. Ball's back in the hands of Milner. And another one. This one a snap throw over. And Eddie playing safe. One end sliding. Milner again takes his position on the rubber. Here comes the pitch into pit call. He swings on it. Lifts it high in the air. It's going out into short right field. Sammy Hale, Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell almost lost the ball. There's a double play on it. Eddie Leaf is doubled off first base. Look for a moment as though that ball was going to be lost. Sammy Hale went out after the ball. Campbell was coming in. And <coughs> Sammy Hale then finally decided to slow up, give Campbell time to get the ball. And Bruce almost lost it. Had to take it right around his knees. Eddie Leaf was about halfway between first and second. 
and he couldn't beat the throw back into first base. So he was doubled off from Campbell to Grimes for the third out. Retiring the side with no runs, one hit, no errors, nobody left on base. That gives Cleveland their first double play of the afternoon. So at the end of six innings of play, it's still reads Cleveland nothing and Washington nothing. Before going into the first half of the seventh, we're going to pause for station identification. 427, 27 minutes past four o'clock Eastern Standard Time. This is station WJSB, Washington. So they took a pause in the uh, ball game there to uh, identify the station and uh, listen to a lot of interesting, uh, well, before this, all this uh, baseball activity going on. There's more baseball activity going on in our studio this afternoon, I think, than there is uh, uh, in this particular game between the uh, Senators and the Indians back in 1939 from Griffith Stadium in Washington, D.C. A lot of people calling in with um, uh, observations about the radio show, this uh, baseball game, about the personalities, the players, and uh, the sports fans in the studio, too, uh, adding uh, some extra information on it. We had a call from a listener who said that Dick Bass, who is the uh, uh, pitcher here, was uh, this is the only game he ever pitched in the major leagues. He went for eight innings, and that was it. Uh, and he had his name in the Encyclopedia of Baseball, right? Yeah, frequently at the end of the season, especially if the team is no longer in the thick of a pennant race, uh, they will ping, bring up people from the minor league teams and give them a chance, a, a uh -huh. chance to show what they have in the last couple of weeks. The Cubs, people in Chicago are well used to this kind of a pattern because we're never in the thick of the pennant race, or usually not. But uh, apparently uh, Bass was brought up from the minor leagues and given one shot at it and uh, didn't impress anybody particularly. Interestingly, too, uh, one of the callers uh, pointed out that the announcer for the uh, Washington ball team is uh, Hall of Fame pitcher Walter Big Train Johnson, uh, mm -hmm. who in the 1920s was one of the, uh, the mainstays of Major League Baseball, an outstanding pitcher not particularly an outstanding announcer. Well, he went from the pitcher's mound mm -hmm. to the broadcast booth, though. Uh, and there we have the same thing happening later on with Lou Boudreau well, you playing in the game. Right. Dizzy Dean is an excellent mm -hmm. example of... Some people are able to make the transition, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Duke Snyder right now does the baseball game for the Montreal Expo team. Uh, uh, you frequently find uh, Ralph Kiner does the play-by-play -play for the San Diego Padres team. But in many cases, uh, uh, the personality of the particular person just doesn't fit the necessities of being an announcer. And Walter Johnson, this was the first year, as the caller pointed out, this was the first year that Walter Johnson actually um, mm -hmm. did the play-by-play. -play. It <coughs> happened in, uh, happens in other sports, too, because uh, Johnny Morris, who does the sports, uh, not necessarily sports casting, but doing a sports... Right. Uh, well, he does reviewing. do the Chicago, Chicago the Bears. football games. He calls well, the Bears football does, games. He? Yeah. Home, yeah. So there you go. There you go. We have it all. Well, we're getting into this. Uh, we're 27 minutes into this baseball game, which totally runs about an hour and 20 minutes when we're all through with it here. And I can tell you the ending of the game, statisticians out there have to look that up for themselves if you want to know that. Uh, we will tell you when it happens, you know, but we don't want to spring it on you now. We'll tell you little more about this and uh, get more of this game as we roll along. You're tuned to WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. My name is Chuck Shaden. With me in the studio is Fred McDonald, professor of history at Northeastern Illinois University, author of a uh, forthcoming book entitled Don't Touch That Dial, published by Nelson Hall. It's due late this month, and it's all about the uh, history of radio programming in the United States from 1920 to 1960. It's a must, and you must uh, get a hold of it, too, when it comes out. And, of course, we'll uh, tell you when it comes out and how you can get it and uh, where you can get it. And we know where you'll be able to get it, right, at the old MGM shop and other fine bookstores, as they say. As we continue this afternoon, we're going to have um, a news program, some musical uh, shots from this station on uh, 1939 WJSV, We've got an Amos and Andy broadcast and the Parker family as well. Next week, uh, we'll be moving into the uh, primetime shows as we bring you part six of the complete broadcast day. We have the Joey Brown show. We have a quiz show entitled Ask It Basket. We have Strange As It Seems, dramatizations of famous people or events. We have the um, Major Bose Original Amateur Hour running a full hour with uh, some incredible, absolutely incredible talent on the lineup up there with somebody perhaps getting the gong from that's the that was the original gong show you know the major bose amateur hour and then we have a fine production on the columbia workshop 
starring Carl Swenson and Ann Shepard. We will wrap up our coverage of the uh, complete broadcast day on the 16th of June with um, a program called Americans at Work. Uh, we will have a news broadcast with Edwin C. Hill, and we're going to have a, uh, a whole slew of big band remotes that were broadcast on WJSV after 11 o'clock in the evening. We'll have Jerry Livingston in the orchestra, Teddy Powell, Louis Prima, and Bob Chester. And then we'll wrap it all up at 1 a.m. in the morning on that broadcast day with the uh, last news of the day followed by the sign-off and the national anthem. On the 23rd of June, we'll go back to our, more of our regular type programming with uh, a variety of shows. On that day, we're going to have Spike Jones and the City Slickers and the Spotlight Review. We'll have Pat O'Brien and Adolph Manju starring on an Academy Award broadcast of The Front Page. We'll have Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore in a comedy show. We'll have Walter Winchell in the Jurgens Journal. And our special guest will be Pat O'Brien, the actor reminiscing about his long career on the stage and on the screen. And on the 30th of June, wrapping up the month of June, which just started, as a matter of fact, we're going to have an afternoon with Fibber McGee and Molly. We'll have the first show of their 1949 season, which happens to be their 15th anniversary broadcast. The program was expanded to an hour, and all of the biggest stars on NBC pop in to say hello to Fibber and to get their own uh, series and season off to a good start. Fibber and Molly will be guests of Bing Crosby on a 1948 Philco Radio Time broadcast. And then from 1951, Fibber McGee and Molly are the host of NBC's 25th anniversary broadcast as Fibber McGee and Molly tune into a super heterodyne and listen to all kinds of vintage sounds from NBC's past. We'll wrap up that date with a regular, complete Fibber McGee and Molly show from 1949 with all of those uh, regulars on the show, Doc, uh, Doc Gamble and Ole and Harlow Wilcox and uh, the whole bunch. So I think you'll really enjoy listening to all of that. If you want to keep track of all of these things, then you should subscribe to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore, the nose and the haircut, are on the cover of our current Nostalgia Newsletter and Guide. It's for the month of June, and that's just the front page of uh, our guide to the good old days for this month. A one-year subscription, 10 issues, is only $7, and you can subscribe right now when you call us at 545-2260. The June is issue has a 1940 article about the Green Hornet, there's a 1942 story about movie dancer Ann Miller and the 1946 look at comedian Henry Morgan and his particular brand of sponsor spoofing comedy. Now, that's just some of the good reading and good entertainment that you'll find in our Nostalgia Newsletter for June. Why don't you subscribe now? Call us at 545-2260. You'll also get some letters from listeners. Well, you won't get them. You'll read some. You'll get advanced news of our Saturday night movies and other special events at Northwest Federal plus the complete schedule of our Saturday afternoon Those Were the Days program here on WNIB. Call 545-2260 to subscribe. We'll begin your subscription with the June issue, which you'll have at the beginning of the week, and we'll include an invoice along with your first copy. The Nostalgia Newsletter gives you loads of information about the shows we play, including original broadcast dates, names of stars and other cast members, network and sponsor identification, even the times of each segment we present, to help you record the old shows for your own collection. It's all there, the complete listing, plus lots of other good reading, and it's all yours when you become a subscriber to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. A one-year subscription is $7. You can sign up right now when you call us here at our studio, 545-2260. That's 545-2260. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not give us a call now, sometime this afternoon, at 545-2260. Running boards and rumble seats were standard equipment on a new Ford back in 1931 when Nelson Hirschberg Ford first put up their We're in Business to Serve You sign on Irving Park Road. In the years since then, running boards and rumble seats have become but a fond memory. But... Nelson Hirschberg Ford is still in the business of serving thousands of Chicagoland families with the bright new Fords at the same location, 5133 West Irving Park Road at Laramie. When you visit Nelson Hirschberg Ford, you'll discover what's made their business prosper all these years. You'll discover that Nelson Hirschberg Ford wants your business today and tomorrow, too. They stand on their reputation as one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers, and you can be sure that when you buy a new Ford or a clean, select used car from Nelson Hirschberg, you'll get more than an automobile. 
you'll get a Nelson Hirschberg automobile, one with reliability and dependability as standard equipment. Ask the man who owns one. Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 Irving Park Road, five blocks west of Cicero at Laramie. This is Chuck Shaden with you on our Those Were the Days program from WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Now let's uh, go back to the baseball game between the Senators and the Indians from Griffith Stadium as broadcast on this complete broadcast day of September 21st of 1939 over WJSV in our nation's capital. And now here again is Walter Johnson. All right, we're going into seventh inning. Still no score in this ball game. Looks like for a moment there we might going to get a break, but uh, Bruce Campbell came in fast to make the catch of Pitko's high fly in back of second base. Sam Hill called for the ball. was a little bit early in making that call. Found out the wind carried that ball out a little further than he thought. So Camel came in just in time to make the catch. Leap was headed towards second base, and before he could get back, he was doubled. Well, Hemsley's up here now. Bass is all warmed up. Here's the first pitch, and it's a little bit too high. Ball one. That's a fast one. Each team has had three hits now. Two singles and a double. Here comes the next pitch, and it's right down in there for strike one. One and one. Bass starts his wind up again. Here it comes. He swings, hits the ground ball, going down to shortstop. Quick takes on a big hop. There's a throw to first, and he's out. Raleigh Hensley grounds out short to first for the first out. And Al Melnar, the pitcher, comes up now. Throws and bats left-handed. Big, strong boy, Melnar. He belonged to Cleveland Indians when I was over there, but we had him in a smaller league. Here comes the first pitch. He swings and fouls it back. One strike. Bass gets another ball. He rubs that ball up, gets a little rosin on his hand. Steps on there, starts his wind up. Here comes the pitch. He swings, hits a high fly foul right up here in front of the Washington dugout. Vernon is coming over there. He has it. And Milner is out for the second out. Two men out. And Boudreaux, the shortstop, comes up. Been up three times, has one hit and three trips up there. This boy was over in Buffalo in the International League this year. Looks like a pretty good ball player. Here comes the first pitch, and he starts to swing. He goes all the way around, but they didn't call it on him. He had to kind of swing his body all the way around, but it's ball one. Here comes the next pitch. It's low and outside. It's ball two. He looks down to Oscar Vett to get that sign. The, um, the managers always have a sign when the count's two nothing or three and one. Tell those fellows what to do. Here comes the next pitch, and it's strike one. That's a fast one. Took that inside corner. It's two and one. Bass starts his wind up again. Here it comes. He swings and fouls it back. Goes right back in a bunch of ladies. And I didn't see what happened, but maybe some lady got it. Two and two on Woodrow. Bass has another ball. Starts his wind up. Here it comes. The fastball a little bit outside, and it's three and two on Woodrow now. Two men out, nobody on. That's the first half, the seventh. There's no score. This has been a pitcher's battle out here between Bass 
And Al Milner, softball. Here comes the next pitch. He swings and hits the fly ball going into center field. Getting is going over there. He's in it and has it. Good throw. Flies out to get in. In right center. Retiring the side with no runs, no hits, no errors, nobody left. Three up and three down. And now everybody stands up as we go into last half of the seventh. Seventh inning stretch. Half right is going to be the leadoff man this last half to seventh. Half has been up twice, failed to hit. Camel going way back out there in deep right field for Taft right. Camel, Chapman, and Weatherly in the outfield. Cleveland has another outfielder sitting on the bench over here who had a wonderful year last year. He looked like one of the best young ball players in baseball, and every ball player picked him to lead this leg in batting this year. And he's not able to stay in that lineup even, so that shows you never can tell. Well, Brad's up there. The first pitch is a little too high. Ball one. Here comes the next one. It's inside for a ball two. Two nothing. Taft right backs away from there. In fact, he backs clear out of the box. Gets a little dirt on his hands. Two nothing on right now. Milner starts his wind up again. Here comes the pitch. He swings and gets a base hit into right field. Past Sammy Hill. It's taken by Bruce Camel, tossed into second base to Boudreaux, and Taft right down on first base. Nobody out, and Charlie Gilbert comes up. Gilbert's playing third base today in place of Buddy Lewis. He's been up twice, has one hit and two trips up there, two base hits. <laughs> Here comes the pitch. And it's low and outside, one nothing. Well, maybe we'll break the ice this time. Going long enough. Six innings and a half and no scores. Here comes the next pitch. He swings and hits one in the left field. Weather is going way back, way back over there. And he tries to make that catch. He dives into the sand. He hits his head against the sand. And apparently he's hurt. Taft right round third base. Charlie Gilbert round third. And he scored. It's a home run for Charlie Gilbert. And little Weatherly is hurt out there. He slid into that the box seat and hurt himself trying to make that catch. I don't know what the decision is going to be. There's an argument down here. If that ball went into the stands, of course, it's only a two-base hit. Did the ball bounce in there, Warren? Did you see? Well, they pushed it over. Yeah. Well, there's going to be an argument down there. Uh, Weatherly is still down, down there. The players are surrounding. Lefty Wiseman, the Cleveland trainer's down there now. The way he went into that stand, he may be hurt. He split in there head first. He had that ball in the tips of his hands, but realizing he was right close to the wall, he tried to slide and check himself, and in doing so, he slid right on in head first into the box into the front of the box seat down there. And he stood a chance of hurting himself. Well, he's up now. Walking around down there. Charlie Gilbert really got a hold of that ball, hit a powerful drive right down the left field line, just fair. Roy Weatherly made a great try and as I said, had that ball in the end of his fingers, but realizing he was right there to the stand, tried to check himself by sliding. And I believe there's a lot of argument. The, the uh, Cleveland ball players who are down in the bullpen are coming up here now, getting into that argument. <laughs> Yeah, 
Joe Sewell, or I mean Luke Sewell, is coming up there now, arguing with Bill Summers out here by third base. And they're all coming. Oscar Vitt is coming up now. He stayed down there to see that Weatherly was all right. Now he's coming up to get in this argument. If that uh, Chapman is in here arguing with Basil at home plate, the whole Cleveland ball club, including some of those boys from the bullpen down there, are in this argument. There goes a bunch of them to the dugout now. They've pulled away, and there's about six of them right down here standing on home plate arguing with Steve Basil. Basil is walking away from him, but they're following him up. Ben Chapman has started back now, tossing his glove up into the air. And Luke Sewell is still down here arguing with Steve Basil. The other boys are breaking away now. Bruce Campbell is going back into right field. Kelton is going back down to third base. Oscar Vitt is walking back to the Cleveland dugout. Ben Chapman is going down now and started his argument with uh, Bill Summers, the umpire down at third base. And they're all going back now. Well, yeah, Summers tells them to go on and play ball. They've argued long enough. Johnny Allen, he even got into it out there. He's going back to the dugout now. And here goes Raleigh Hensley down towards third base. I don't know whether he's going down to talk with Bill Summers some more or not. But anyway, Taft Wright and Charlie Gilbert are both over on the bench, and I think they're going to allow Charlie a home run. The ball did not go into the stands down there. If it has, it would have been a two-base hit. There used to be a ground rule here when that ball went around the point of that, those seats. But I don't know whether that's in effect now or not. The ball was out of sight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he did. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, he was after that ball and had it in the end of his hand and he and his glove, glove and bounced on off there. Well, anyway, we're out in front two to nothing. There's nobody out and Jim Vernon is up there. They're all started to go. Started out here now. He swings on that next pitch, hits a high fly up into the infield. Woodrow calls for it. He has it right down there by second base. And Vernon is out. That's one out. That's the last half of the seventh. Washington is out in front now. Two to nothing. One man out. Nobody on. And Gideon, the center fielder, comes up. <laughs> Milner having a little trouble getting a sign. Finally gets it, starts his wind up. Here it comes. And it's a little bit too high. Ball one. Miller starts his wind up again. Here comes the pitch, and it's a curve ball for strike one. That's called one and one. Miller starts his wind up again. Here comes he swing, hits the fly, going in left field. Weatherly standing there waiting, and he has it. Get in, goes out on a fly ball to Roy Weatherly in left field for the second out. And Rick Farrell comes up now. Farrell has been up twice. Failed to hit. Miller starts his wind up. Here it comes. He swings and fouls it back. It's one strike.
Starts his wind up again. Here comes, he swings it, the high fly right up into infield. Keltner calls for it, he's under it, and he has it. Farrell flies out to Keltner. Down at third base, retiring the side with two runs, two hits, no errors, nobody left. So at the end of seven innings, Washington is out in front, two to nothing. Little Weatherly's getting a nice hand as he comes in from left field. He made a great try out there for that ball. Might have been badly injured. Okay. More of the uh, game between the Senators and the Indians. Back on September 21st of 1939. It's a Thursday afternoon, the last game of the season for these two teams. The score is Washington 2, Cleveland nothing, and we'll pick up on that. We're going to talk with our guest Fred McDonald a little bit from now about, um, uh, we said the, uh, the two teams here were not really doing too well at this point in the season, the end of the season. We're going to find out which teams were doing uh, very well at this uh, uh, stage of the game and who was going into the World Series and all of that sort of thing. Just a moment. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those Were the Days program from WNIB Chicago at FM 97. You buy with confidence when you get the townhouse guarantee from townhouse TV and appliances. Give them a try. They won't be undersold and you won't be underserviced. Shop around, get the best deal possible, and then visit townhouse. Townhouse guarantees that you'll get the best price on the hundreds of Frigidaire refrigerators, washers, dryers, and ranges in stock. And there's more. Townhouse guarantees to make delivery on the day promised, guarantees normal installation on all products delivered, guarantees to move your old appliance to the basement or the garage or to remove it from the premises if you like. Check with Townhouse and take advantage of the big Townhouse guarantee from Townhouse TV and Appliances, 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. Open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where plenty of free parking makes it a pleasure to shop your favorite store or service. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Womack. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. Easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Shop and save for dad and grad at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center in Wilmette. Chuck Shaden with you. Fred McDonald is here, too. And, Fred, we talked about uh, the fact that the uh, Senators and the Indians were not le uh, leading the league at this <laughs> point in time. Uh, what was the number one team in each of the leagues at this, uh, at this stage of the game? Where, who, what else was happening? Well, in the American League, which, of course, is the league uh, that we're listening to uh, this afternoon, the New York Yankees uh, were way, way out in front. They were 17 and a half games in first place ahead of the second place Boston uh, uh, Red Sox. This was a team that, in fact, that very day, the day we were listening to the, uh, the Senators game, the uh, the Yankees with Mario Marius Russo on the mound uh, defeated the Chicago White Sox with Bill Dietrich as their pitcher 5-2. to two. Home runs were hit in that game by Joe Flash Gordon and by Bill Dickey. Uh, the Yankees were uh, incredibly strong. In fact, that year, uh, Joe DiMaggio was on his way to a batting championship in that White Sox game, he went 0 for 4, and that dropped his average to 385. He ended up winning the battle, batting title at a 381 uh, batting average. So there was really not much of a race uh, in the American League. It was the Yankees again, and uh, it was just a matter for Joe McCarthy's team to play out the rest of the season. Where you did have a, a real uh, uh, race going on was in the National League. Uh, the Cincinnati Reds were two and a half games in front of the St. Louis Cardinals with about a week and a half or two to go in the season. A very tight race. The Cubs were in third place, ten games mm -hmm. out, but for all practical purposes, they were light years out of first place. The real rivalry then was the uh, St. Louis team and the Cincinnati team. The St. Louis Cardinals, the team of Eno Slaughter and Ducky mm -hmm. Medwick and Johnny Mize, and the Cincinnati Reds uh, led with manager uh, Bill McKechnie, and they had p people on the team like uh, Vince DiMaggio and Ernie Lombardi, Bucky Walter and Paul Derringer were their top pitchers. Uh, when the season, when the dust finally settled at the end mm -hmm. of the season, <laughs> the uh, Cincinnati team 
uh, had won the pennant. There was a showdown se uh, series between the Cards and the Reds at the end of September, and the uh, the Reds uh, uh, won the two out of three of the game, or th all three of the games, and broke the back of the uh, Cardinal threat. So that the the Cincinnati team went into the World Series for the first time in uh, 20 years when they won the pennant in in 1939 into the series against uh, the perennial champion New York Yankees. And one can guess what would happen uh, in four straight games. The Yankees clubbed uh, the Cincinnati team. And although they were Cinderella team and winning the pennant, the, the Cinderella uh, pumpkin, or coach rather, turned into a pumpkin <laughs> in October. Some good statistics there. I appreciate that. I have to confess that I have a very, very faint knowledge of um, baseball history. And uh, I'm not a big uh, sports fan in general, so I appreciate very much... Uh, uh, the help from Fred McDonald today and from the listeners who are calling and giving us all of this information and um, from the umpire in the studio here, Mr. Paradise, who's uh, laying a lot of action on us too here, who is too shy to get on the microphone to uh, <laughs> to tell us uh, some of his background, but we try to feed it to you as best we can. <laughs> now let's go back to the mound out there at uh, uh, Griffith Stadium as we continue listening into this game between the Senators and the Indians on the broadcast day, September 21st of 1939. Well, Bass is out there tossing that ball over. Harry, come in, boy. And well, we see that Ben Chapman coming in from the center field. He's still arguing about that play down there. The only person that didn't enter into the argument on the Cleveland team is the one person that participated in the play, and that happened to be Roy Weatherly. Weatherly, after he got back on his feet, remained in left field, and on his way in had nothing to say to the third base umpire. But it stands, as was originally told you by Walter Johnson, as a case of Wheaties for Charlie Gilbert. Now we're going into the first half of the eighth inning with Weatherly, the leadoff man, bats from the left side. They're riding the umpire in chief behind the plate from the Cleveland bench, and he's yelling over there, and I, if it continues, we'll probably see a couple of the boys get a shower a few minutes earlier than they anticipated for the day. Well, it's the first half of the eighth inning, and Washington's out in front by a score of two to nothing. Weatherly, left fielder, the left-hand batter's coming up now. Been up three times, walked once. Bass is ready, in comes the first pitch. He swings on it, hits a base hit between third and short, out into left field, Taft right field it. The throw comes in too quick at second base, and Weatherly opens the inning with a single into left field. That's hit number four off Bass. That it puts a runner on first, nobody out. Ben Chapman's coming up now, center fielder, right-hand batter. Chapman's been up three times. He's walked twice, so he's hitless out of one official time up. Bass goes into a stretch, a look at first. Here's the pitch coming in. Ben swings on it, a hard hit ball by third base, down into left field. Weatherly's rounding second on his way to third. Right fields the ball, makes his throw to Eddie Leap. At second base, Leap fires it over to Vernon. Chapman made his turn and then had to beat back into first base, one end sliding, but he moved Weatherly around to third base. On a single, Charlie Gilbert dived after the ball, no chance to get his glove on it. So that's two straight singles for Cleveland. And the Patron is on first and third with nobody out and brings little Sammy Hale, second baseman, a right-hand batter up. Sammy's been up three times. He walked in the first inning. So he's hit with out of two official times at bat. Two to nothing is the score in favor of Washington. Bass looks in, gets a signal from Farrell, goes into a stretch. You look over his shoulder. Chapman on first. Here's the pitch. Sammy takes it. That knuckle ball across the outside corner for a call strike. Strike one on Hale. First inning in the ball game. Cleveland's been able to get two hits in an inning. Bass again takes a stretch. Look at Chapman on first base. Here's the pitch coming in. Sammy swings on it. It's going out into center field. It's a base hit. Weatherly scoring from third. Chapman moves on the second. Gideon fields the ball, makes the throw into second base. Well, that's three straight hits for Cleveland. And it drives in the first run of the ball game for the Indians. Makes the score now read. Washington two, Cleveland one. The tying runs on second base. Runners are on first and second. Nobody out. The infield's in now. They're looking for that sacrifice. Jim Vernon's just off the grass at first base, and Shelley Gelber just off the edge of the grass at third. Let's go. 
Das taking plenty of time, readjusting his cap, walks onto the rubber, looks into Rick Farrell. Little how quick short stops, playing close second now, attempting to hold Ben Chapman near the bag. He'll go off with the pitch. Here it comes, and he swings and misses. Camel went after that knuckleball, breaking in low. He took the swing and missed, boss strike one. Takes a stretch now, look back at second base. Here's the next pitch coming in. And he swings again, fouls it up into the upper tier of the grandstand. That puts Bass out in front of Bruce Campbell, the batter, to the count, strike two. That backs the infield up now. Jolly Galbert easing back. Jim Vernon's going back. Ben Chapman yelling something in to Bruce Campbell. Nobody out, runners on first and second. One run in for Cleveland, score reading Washington two, Cleveland one. Here's the next pitch coming in, it's inside. That hit Campbell on the foot, he took it. And he, being hit by a pitch ball, loads the bases. That moves Sammy Hale to second base. And then Chapman to third. So the bases are loaded with nobody out. Big Kara Squalls. Started warming up in the bullpen for Washington. Right-hander. Well, the bases are loaded with nobody out, and up comes Chalton, third baseman, a right-hand batter. Ken Sitless out of three times up. Tying runs only 90 feet away now in the form of Ben Chapman on third base. The infield's in. They're going to shut off that run at the plate. If they can, Dolphy's backing him up. Bucky's backing him up. Here comes the pitch in. Outside, low, ball one. Ball one on Keltner. Bass is not taking a wind up. Just the stretch. Here's the next one coming in. Keltner swings on it, foul tips it back against the screen. And the count's one and one. Ball one, strike one. Drake Farrell gets a new ball, goes out to Bass. Wraps the ball off, goes to the rosin bag. First half of the eighth inning. Bass walks on, gets the signal. Going to take his wind up now, realizing the bases are loaded. Here it comes, and Keltner fouls it. Off the first baseline, over to the stands. The count reads ball one and strike two. Rick Farrell's dropping the new one off this time before it goes out to Bass. Bass had been breezing along in the ball game. He'd only given up three hits till we entered the first half of the eighth, and on the first three men up, single. Taking plenty of time. One and two is a count on Ken Keltner. Here comes the next pitch in. It's low, ball two. Two and two is a count. Big Ellick is working down on the Washington bullpen. That starts the wind up, in comes the next pitch, and Keltner swings on it, hits it out into deep left center field. Gideon's going way back, way back. It hits off the stands, bounces back into the field. Chapman has scored. Hale's rounding third, he's scoring. And Bruce Campbell pulls up at third base with Keltner pulling up at second. That ball was well hit, about two more feet of height or distance on the ball, and it would have gone into the left field bleachers. That puts Cleveland out in front of the ball game, a double that scores Chapman and Hale and moves Bruce Campbell into third base. That makes the score. Read now, Cleveland three, Washington two, runners on second and third. There's still nobody out in the ball game. And Oscar Grimes, first baseman, a right-hand batter, is coming up. They're going to put him on base, an intentional pass. First pitch comes in outside. Farrell stepping out to take it. That will be walk number six off Bass. And the first intentional pass of the afternoon. Counts ball two. Now in comes ball three. Big Alex working a little faster down in the bullpen. Now here comes ball four. And Oscar Grimes is purposely passed. That again loads the bases. 
And this time it brings rollicking Raleigh Hensley to the plate catcher, right-hand batter. Raleigh has one hit out of three times up. Bass looks in, gets his signal. Starts to wind up, then comes the first pitch to Hensley. He swings and misses for strike one. Grimes is on first base, Kelton is on second, and Campbell's on third. Here's the next pitch coming into Raleigh, and he bunts it down the first baseline. Jim Vernon charges the ball, hits his hand, lets it rolls away. It rolls away from him, and in comes Campbell scoring on the play. Kelton moving into second, and Grimes into first. Well, they'll give Jim Vernon a boot on that ball. That's the first error of the afternoon. It scores the fourth run of the inning for Cleveland. Makes the score now, Reed. Cleveland four and Washington two. The bases are still loaded. And up comes Al Milner, the pitcher. He throws and bats from the left side. There's still nobody up. Bass looks in, gets the signal. Dodgers wind up, in comes the pitch to Milner, and he swings on it, fouls it over the stands for strike one. Milner is the eighth man to come up in the inning for Cleveland. Bass is ready. Here's the next one coming in outside high, one and one, ball one, strike one. Bass standing out, rubbing the ball off. Goes into a wind-up. In comes the next pitch to Milner. It's outside. Ball two. Two and one. The base is loaded. Nobody out. Four runs in for Cleveland. Here's the next pitch coming into Al. He swings on it, hits the ground ball, swing down to second base, leap is up with it over to second. He's out, but no chance for a double play. Ken Keltner scores as Al Milna forces Raleigh Hemsley at second base from Eddie Leap to Hal Quick. For the first out of the inning, Oscar Grimes moved in the third on the play. Ken Keltner scoring. That's run number five in for Cleveland. Makes the score now, Reed Cleveland five, Washington two, runners are on first and third, and Lou Boudreaux, shortstop, a right-hand batter, the ninth man to come up in the inning. Now at the plate, he has one hit out of four official times up this afternoon. Bass takes a stretch, a look over his shoulder, Milner on first base. Here's the first pitch coming into Boudreaux, and he takes it as low and off the outside for ball one. Ball one on Lou. Here's the next pitch coming into Boudreaux. He swings on it, hits it in the air. It's going down right field way, curving over. Lands out of the reach of Pitco, dropping into the box seats off the right field line to even the count at ball one and strike one. One and one on Boudreaux. Bass gets his signal. Here's the next pitch coming in. Boudreaux takes it across the outside corner for a call strike. Lou followed that one, made no attempt to go after it. The count reads ball one, strike two. We're in the first half of the eighth inning. Cleveland's out in front five to two. Here's the next one coming in to Boudreaux. It's inside. Breaking inside and around the knees to even the count of two and two. Here's the next one coming in. Boudreaux swings on it, hits it, goes down to second base. Lee feels the ball, tosses to Quick. Quick drops the ball, but picks it up in time to tag Al Nola as he goes by him. 
Oscar Grimes scoring with Milner going out at second from Eddie Lee to Hal Quick. That's run number six in for Cleveland. Two men are out. The runner on first, and up comes Roy Weatherly, left fielder, the left hand batter. Weatherly opened the inning with a single to left field. Bass takes a stretch, look over at Boudreaux, and comes the first pitch to Roy. He swings and misses for strike one. Strike one on Weatherly. There's the next pitch coming in. Roy takes it. It's outside. A little low. And the count's one and one. There goes a toss over to Vernon at first base. Lou Boudreaux back in plenty of time. The ball's back in the hands of Bass. He again goes into a stretch. One and one is a count on... Weatherly, here's the next one coming in. That one was the wild pitch, hit the ground. Rick Farrell picked it up and made a wild toss into second base. Boudreaux went in sliding. Probably charged Bass with a wild pitch on that ball. Hitting the ground in front of the plate. Rick knocked it down, picked it up. Boudreaux was a little slow in getting off from first base. There was a possible chance of getting going into second, but Rick's throw was a little low. It hit the ground, knocked down quite quick, but no chance for a tag of Boudreaux as he went sliding in. So we have a runner on second base now, and the count reading two and one on Roy Weatherly. Here's the next pitch coming in. It's inside, drives him away. Three and one is the count now. Bass will have to come in with this one. Roy will have his second walk of the afternoon and number seven of the afternoon off Bass. Takes a look back at second, and it comes, and Weatherly swings on it, fouls it off the left field line over the stand. And the strings run out. 3 2 is the count now. The big one will be coming in. Pass goes into a stretch. Here it comes. And Weatherly hits it high in the air. It's going into left field very high. Wright's having plenty of time to get under it. Taft makes the catch for out number three to retire the side. Cleveland scoring. Six runs off four hits, one error, and having one runner left on base. So at the end of the first half of the eighth inning, the score now reads Cleveland six and Washington two. And before we move into the last half of the eighth, we pause again for station identification. Two minutes to five o'clock, WJSB, Washington. And we'll take advantage of that break to identify ourselves and do a little business, too. This is WNIB Chicago at FM 97. I'm Chuck Shaden with you every Saturday afternoon from 1 to 5 with our sounds of uh, the good old days of radio. And what we're doing now uh, today and what we have been doing since the first Saturday in May is tuning in to a complete broadcast day from radio station WJSV, Washington, D.C. That day, Thursday, September 21st of 1939, and right now, as you heard the announcer 40 years ago say, it's two minutes to five o'clock. That's where we are in this broadcast day. And we'll be continuing. There's another 20 minutes uh, to run on this ball game. And then we have more of their programming up to Amos and Andy and the Parker family. And then, of course, the next two weeks uh, will conclude the broadcast day. So it's uh, quite a good comprehensive look at the, uh, the good old days and the good old day, uh, a, an historic day. September 21st, 1939. And that, of course, you well know if you were with us last Saturday and you heard the speech by President uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Right now, we have a brand new month. This is the 2nd of June, and so we have a brand new cassette tape of the month. Now, the tape for June is an hour-long Lux Radio Theater production of The African Queen, starring Humphrey Bogart and Greer Garson. And listen to this. Miss, it's me, miss. I come back a lot sooner than I said. Oh. Well, the Germans have been here too, eh? Yes. They've, they've been here, Mr. Ornett. When I got to the mines at Limbazi, everything was a shamble. Deserted. Burnt to the ground, just like the village here. Uh, Reverend around, miss? My brother is dead. Oh. Oh, well, now... 
Now, ain't that awful? If them Germans are shoot a Reverend, there ain't nobody safe. They were here three days ago. They didn't shoot him. They... They struck him, and his heart was, was bad, and... Oh, well, that's... <laughs> now, that's certainly too bad, miss. That's all I can say. <laughs> I tell you what, miss. You get your things together, we'll get aboard the Queen and clear out. Them Germans are sure to come back. But why? Why should they come back Why, they'll be looking here? for the boat, miss, for the African Queen. She's not much, but they'd give a lot to get their hands on her, you bet. And for what's aboard her, too? Blast and gelatin, tin grub, cylinders of oxygen and hydrogen... Heaps of things I was bringing to the mine. But where could we go? Why, out there on the river, miss. Get behind an island where it's quiet and safe. We can talk about what to do then. I'll get ready. That's the ticket, miss. You bet. You come with me. That's a scene from the African Queen as heard on the Lux Radio Theater broadcast of December 15th, 1952. It's our cassette tape of the month for June, and this broadcast stars Humphrey Bogart recreating his Academy Award-winning screen role, plus Greer Garson and Hans Conried is in this, too, in the radio version of that classic 1952 motion picture. It's yours for just $5 this month from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can pick up this tape at any office of Northwest Federal Savings, or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop, at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. The Lux Radio Theater presents Humphrey Bogart as the crude, coarse, and dirty captain of the African Queen, with Greer Garson as the refined, well-educated missionary who shares the voyage down the wild and dangerous rivers of Africa. It's a classic, it really is, and it's yours for just $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Our cassette tape for June the African Queen on the Lux Radio Theater. Now, since this is so close to the uh, uh, end of May, we thought we'd mention one last time that you still will let you get your May cassette tape for only $5 if you order it this weekend for sure. That's uh, Stagecoach starring John Wayne and Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae. So if you want that, we'll still let you get the May cassette tape for $5. Otherwise, it's $6, but you can get it for $5 if you send it in this weekend, it can be postmarked, well, Monday. Mail it Monday morning, and then you're okay, right? To the hall closet, box 421, Morton Grove. And the same goes for the uh, Radio Month special, which was the three-tape set of uh, One Man's Family for $10. So if you want, if you had forgotten to get that or you didn't get around to getting it and you still decide that you'd like to have it, you can send for it this weekend. Mail it Monday morning at the very latest and we'll send it out to you at the uh, at the May Radio Month special price. $10 for the One Man's Family set, $5 for the Stagecoach with John Wayne, Tales of the Texas Rangers with Joel McRae. Occurs to me we got some really heavyweight uh, actors in these cassettes. Uh, in May, John Wayne and Joel McRae, and uh, now in, uh, in June, uh, Humphrey Bogart and Greer Garson. Pretty good stuff. It's good listening, too. Hi, I'm Barrett Dean, and I was a drummer on the Louis Armstrong Band. When I started buying shoes from Paul Meyer on Central Street in Evanston, after I left Louis and worked with Jack Teagarden, Bill Reinhardt's jazz band, and the Dukes of Dixieland, I was still getting my loafers from Paul. In fact, not long ago, when I toured Europe with Benny Goodman, my grandchildren picked up shoes at Paul Meyer's shoe store. So take a tip from Barrett Dean and get your shoes from Paul Meyer's shoe store in Evanston. This is Chuck Shaden with you on our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago, FM 97. Want to see a good movie tonight? Like to see two good movies tonight? Come on over to our Northwest Federal Community Center Auditorium at 4901 Irving Park Road in Chicago. We have a double feature for you tonight, a good old comedy and a good old mystery. The comedy is Blondie's Lucky Day from 1946 with Penny Singleton and Arthur Lake as Blondie and Dagwood with Larry Sims, Marjorie Kent, Frank Jenks, Charles Arndt. Dagwood is fired, so he goes into competition with J.C. Dithers to form the Bumstead Construction Company. <laughs> and uh, our second half of our double bill is Ellery Queen, Master Detective from 1940, starring Ralph Bellamy as the inquisitive author assisting his inspector father at solving a murder based on the popular detective mystery series. It's a good one and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Double feature tonight at Northwest Federal. Doors open at 7.30. 
Film begins at uh, 8 o'clock. Donation is $1.25 per person, with all proceeds going to recognized charities. I'll be there tonight. Ho hope that you will join us for Blondie's Lucky Day and Ellery Queen, Master Detective. Now, I think it's time, uh, Fred McDonald, don't you think we ought to get back to this uh, baseball game between the Senators and the Indians? Sponsored... Please. They said it's sponsored by Wheaties. I haven't heard too many Wheaties commercials in here, have you? No, no. We've seen a lot of Wheaties uh, potential advertisers out there playing ball. <laughs> but uh, six to two is the score as we head into the final uh, inning or so. Okay, yeah, this is the wrap-up now, and there's uh, uh, about 20 minutes to go, and it's just a couple minutes before 5 o'clock on uh, September 21st of 1939. I'd like to remind you folks that Miller are in the neighborhood of Miller's Market at 2135 4th Street Northeast. Walter Johnson will be out there tonight in the personal appearance. Be glad to autograph any Wheaties that you may purchase during the time he's there, or any gloves or anything else you might want autographed. Well, we're going into the last half of the eighth inning. Bass, the pitcher, is due to be the leadoff man. He's going to be taken out in favor of a pinch hitter. Al Evans, the catcher, is going in to bat for Bass. Pigeon, pigeon, please. Evans. Evans. Batting, batting for Bass. For Bass. Al Evans, rookie catcher, is going in to hit for Bass. To open the last half of the eighth inning. Big Al Milner starts his wind-up. Here's the first one coming in. It's high, ball one. Fastball came in over the plate, but too high. And Evans watched it go by. The count's ball one. Here's the next one coming in. Al swings on it, lifts it in the air. Fly ball going into short center field. Sammy Hale's out under it. And Sammy Hale makes the catch in short center for the first out <laughs> of the inning. So we have one away, nobody on base. And up comes Eddie Lee. Second baseman, a right-hand batter. Eddie has two hits out of three times up. Big Al's only given up five hits so far this afternoon. He looks into Raleigh Hensley, gets the signal, goes into a wind-up. Here's the first pitch coming in. And Leap swings on it, foul tips it, goes by Hensley, bounces off the chest protector of the umpire. And a new ball goes out to Big Al Milton. Strike one is a count on Leap. Alexander's still in the bullpen for Washington. Here's the pitch coming in, and Leap fouls it. Back over the stands, put Al Miller out in front with the count strike two. The Gellick will take up the pitching duties for the Senators in the first half of the night. Miller is ready for the next pitch into Leap. Here it is. It's high. The ball one. One and two on Leap. In comes the next pitch to Eddie. He started to swing, but changed his mind. It was too high for ball two. That evens a count of two and two. One out, nobody on, last half of the eighth. Cleveland six, Washington two. Here's the next one coming in, and Leap fouls it back into the screen. The count remains two and two. Raleigh Hemsley gets a new one, tosses it out to Al Milner. Don't forget an off day tomorrow, no game. The New York Yankees move in Saturday. Here's the next one coming in. It's high, ball three. And the big pitch will be coming in to Eddie Lee. The single game Saturday, getting underway at three o'clock. Single game on Sunday, also getting underway at three o'clock. Al starts his wind up. Here it comes. And Lee hits it, a ground ball, goes between third and short, out into left field. Weatherly feels it on the ground, makes his throw into Boudreaux at second base. And Eddie Leaf is on first with his third hit of the afternoon. Pretty good day's work for a youngster. Three hits out of four times up. So it's one away, a runner on first, and how quick, shortstop coming up. He's hitless out of three times up. That's from the right side. Nolan takes a stretch. Look over first base way, in comes the pitch, and Quick takes one across that inside corner, waist high for a call strike. In comes the next pitch to Quick, and he swings on it, hits it in the air, it's going into right field, Campbell backs up, makes the catch, we're out number two, gets his throw in to Sammy Hale at second base. So it's two away with Eddie Leap on first, and Alec Pitko, right fielder, right-hand batter coming up. He walked in the first inning, fly to right field in the fourth, 
and hit into a double play in the sixth. In comes the first pitch to Pitko, and he swings on it. Foul tips it. Goes back against the stands. Count strike one. Now gets a signal from Raleigh Hensley. Here's the next one coming in outside high. It's a wild pitch. The ball gets away from Hensley. And there goes Eddie Leap into second base. That's a wild pitch for Al Milner. Moves Eddie Leap into second base and makes the count read one and one on Pitko. Al standing with his back to the plate, rubbing that ball off. Takes a stretch, a look at second base. Here, here it comes, and Pitko fouls it back over the stands. Gives Milner the edge for the count, reading ball one and strike two. Two men are away, a runner on second. The last half of the eighth inning, and Cleveland leading six to two. Scoring all six of their runs in that first half of the eighth, and they batted ten men. Here comes the next pitch in, and Pitko hits one high bounding ball down over second base. It bounds high, gets away from Boudreau. Here comes the throw into the plate. But Eddie Leaf is in, sliding in. That's a base hit for Pitko. The ball took a high bound, going down over second base. Lou Boudreau went over to field the ball. It hit the tip of his glove, rolled over his head. Eddie Leaf rounded thir third and scored, although there was a play at the plate. Lou Boudreau's throw was a little high. Hensley went down on into tagging, but Eddie slid around him and over the edge of the plate and scored with the third run of the ball game for Washington. <laughs> We have a runner on first now with two men out and up comes Taft right. Left field, a left hand batter. Taft has one hit out of three official times at bat. Here's the first pitch coming in. He takes it. It's low. Ball one. Ball one on right. Here's the next pitch coming in. Taft swings on it. Hits the ground ball down second base way. Sammy Hale. Steals the ball, tosses to Lou Boudreau, who steps on second, and Sammy Wright forces Pitko at second base for the third out of the inning to retire the side. With one run, two hits, no errors, one runner left on base. So at the end of eight innings of play, the score now reads Cleveland six and Washington three. Big Alexander Carasquell is going to be the pitcher for Washington as we go into the first half of the ninth inning. And for that ninth inning, here is Walter Johnson. All right, well, the score is six to three, Cleveland now. If we can hold on this inning, then we need three runs to tie this ball game up. Big Alec Carasquell is out there on the mound for the Senators now. Young Evans went up to bat in place of Bass. <clears throat> and Ben Chapman will be first up for Cleveland. Chapman's been up four times, walked twice, and has one base hit. Alec is out there tossing that ball in. It's the first half of the ninth. Getting a little a lot of shadows extending out over the field now. Hmm? No, he didn't give me the sign I was waiting for him to. Attention, please. Kara Squell. Now pitching. Or Washington. Kara Squell is out there, and here Chapman swings on that first pitch, hits the line drive right over Quick's head down at shortstop. He rounds first base right, hustles that ball in. Chapman backs. Goes back to first. So Chapman is on first base. Sammy Hale, the second baseman, comes up. Sammy's been up four times. He has one walk and one single and four trips up there. It's the first half of the ninth. Cleveland out in front, six to three. Alex steps on there. Here's the first pitch on Hale. He swings, gets a base hit into left field, taken by Taft right on a big hop. And Chapman is down on second base. Sammy Hale on first. Nobody out. 
And Camel, right fielder, comes up there. Camel has been up four times. He has a two-base hit. He was hit last time up there. Bass hit him to fill the bases. Two on, nobody out. Here comes the first pitch on Camel. It's a ball a little bit outside. One ball. One to nothing. Charlie Gilbert laying in pretty close down on third, looking for that bunt. But Alec finally backs off of there. Steps up on there again now. Here comes the pitch. He swings, hits a fly ball going into center field. Getting is coming in. He's under that ball and makes a catch. Camel flies out to get in. In short left center for the first out. And Keltner, the third baseman, comes up now. He's been up four times. He has one hit, a double, his last time up. Man on first and second, there's one out. First half the ninth. Alec steps on there, takes the stretch, here comes the pitch, and it's strike one that's called. Came right down through there with a fast one. Keltner watched it go by. One strike. Alex steps on there again. Takes his stretch. Here comes the pitch. He swings and misses. That was a nice curved ball. Broke away. Two strikes on Kellner. Alex steps on there again. Backs off of there. And now Keltner backs out of there. Time is called. Keltner gets a little dirt on his hand. Walks back up in the batter's box. Alex steps on there. Here comes the pitch. And it's ball one. That's a fast one. It was a little bit outside there. Quick is ducking in around second base down there. Trying to keep Ben Chapman back there. Leap came over, but he's going back down in his position. Here comes the next pitch. He swings and fouls it back. And Alec gets a new ball. One and two. Two men on. Cleveland out in front, six to three. Alex steps on there again now. Here comes the pitch. He swings and misses. Chapman's on his way to third base, and he's out. Kellner goes down swinging, and Chapman is out, trying to steal third. Sides retired with no runs, two hits, no errors, one man left. So we're going into the last half of the ninth with Cleveland out in front, six to three. We need three runs to tie this score. And Charlie Gilbert will be up there first. Charlie Gilbert playing third base in today's ball game. He's been up three times. He has two base hits and three trips up there, one double and a home run. Milner's out there tossing that ball in. Charlie Gilbert's getting a nice hand from these lady folks. Charlie's played a nice ball game out there today. There goes the throw down to second base, goes around the infield, back to Milner. And the umpire says play ball. Uncle Nick is down on the coaching line to third, first base. Now here comes the first pitch. It's a curved ball, a little bit too low. It's ball one. Eisenstadt down the bullpen warming up for Cleveland. Here comes the next pitch. And it's a fast ball. It's inside ball two. Two nothing. <laughs> Last half the ninth. We need three runs to tie. 
Miller starts his wind up. Here it comes. And it's strike one. That's a fast one right down the middle. Two and one. Starts his wind up again. He swings, hits a ground ball down to second base. And Sammy Hill comes up with it, tosses two Grimes, and he's out. Gilbert goes out. Second to first for the first out. And Vernon comes up now, first baseman. He's been up three times, failed to hit. Milner starts his wind up. Here comes the pitch. It's a fastball inside, ball one. Vernon backs away a bit. Milner takes his wind up again. Here comes the pitch. And this time it's strike one that's called. Vernon started after that one, then pulled away. Got a pretty good eye, this boy. Doesn't hit it many bad balls. Milner takes his wind up again. Here comes a pitch. He swings and fouls it back. One and two. Takes his wind up again. Here comes a pitch. He swings and fouls another and back. This time right on over the stand. And he gets another ball out there. One and two on Vernon. Here's a wind up. And a pitch, it's a high and inside. Ball two, two and two. Milner starts his wind up again. Here comes the pitch. He swings it's a high foul over back of third base. Kellner's going over there, but he can't quite get it. It drops over there in the box seats and bounces up and out. And Keltner comes up with it, tosses in to the umpire who throws it away. I mean, he throws it back to the Washington dugout. That will be used in batting practice. Ball was a little bit rough, probably. Milner takes his wind up again. Here comes the pitch, and he goes down swinging. Milner came in there with a fastball just a little bit inside. Vernon took a cut at it, but missed. And Gideon comes up now, center fielder. He's been up three times, failed to hit. Two men out, nobody on. And it's six to three. Here comes the next pitch. It's strike one. It just took that outside corner. One strike. Milner starts his wind up again. Here comes the pitch. He swings and fouls it back. It's two strikes on Gideon now. Starts his wind up again. Here it comes. It's a fastball a little bit outside. One and two. Milner starts his wind up again. Here comes the pitch, and he starts after that one, but lets it go. It's a little bit too high. It's two and two. Get in. Had a notion that time, but he changed his mind. A little bit too high. Here comes the next pitch, and he's called out on strikes. Milner came down in there, took that inside corner, and get in. Takes it, and Cleveland wins the ball game with six runs. Nine hits, no errors. Washington, three runs, seven hits, and one error. And as Harris told you, there'll be no ball game here tomorrow. The Yankees come in Saturday for a single game and a single game with the Yankees Sunday. All right, Harry, if you have something over there. Well, that just about tells the story of this afternoon's ball game. The winning pitcher, of course, was Big Al Milner, and the losing pitcher was Bass the starting pitcher for Washington. We'd like to again remind you fans of Miller's Market, 2135 4th Street Northeast. Walter Johnson will be out seeing you tonight. And tomorrow night, you fans around the Calvert Market at 1862 Columbia Road Northwest. We'll be greeting you again over the air Saturday afternoon for that first game between the Yanks and the Senators. The second game of that series will be played Sunday afternoon. This is Harry McTighe speaking for Walter Johnson. Thanks for listening, and so long. This is Columbia Station for the nation's capital. It's 5.17 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. Here's a distinguished timepiece, the 21-jewel Bulova President, in the charm and color of natural gold. Curved, 
streamlined, an exceptional value. WJSV, Washington. Boy, when's the last time you heard uh, B-U-L-O-V-A, Bull of a Watch Time, huh? How about that? Well, that's it. That's the bell game. Uh, wrap up there between the Senators and the Indians, 6-2. to two. Cleveland uh, was, was the winning team from September 21st of 1939. And Walter Johnson there doing a personal appearance at a couple of markets there. He said earlier that uh, he'd be willing to sign uh, autographs on boxes of Wheaties. <laughs> or other things like that. It's amazing. Um, six to three. I said six to two. Six to three. Somehow we have a six to two handicap here today. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our Those With a Days program from WNIB Chicago, FM 97. The fine family of Paterno offers you a selection of fine wines from the vineyards of the world. From California to France, from Italy to Portugal, you'll find the Paterno wine cellar stocked with the widest selection of wines from all the best places. Paterno Foremost Liquors at 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. It's the largest beverage store of its kind in all Chicagoland. A visit to the Paterno Wine Cellar is an experience you won't forget, and you'll return often to keep your own wine cellar stocked. Whether it's an intimate candlelit dinner for two or an important dinner party for quite a few, you'll find everything you need to add the word special to your next occasion. Visit the wine cellar at Paterno Foremost Liquors, open Monday through Saturday from 9 in the morning, until 10 at night. Sundays from noon to 6. Paternal Foremost Liquors, 5303 Milwaukee Avenue at Central, just north of Foster. Well, we have lots more of this broadcast day coming up today, and of course in the next two weeks we'll be wrapping it all up. And uh, we've been talking about sports and uh, the baseball season in the background. Bob Kolosowski is going to be talking with us about movies, the motion picture scene in 1939 in just a moment or so. Speaking of movies, uh, brings to mind Metro Golden Memories because uh, we have lots of movie things at our MGM shop. I'd like to invite you to visit us over there at 5941 West Irving Park Road just east of Austin. We have uh, an amazing selection of uh, new things to bring back the old times and old things to provide more good times. We have hundreds of recordings of old-time radio shows on cassette, 8-track tape, and LP records plus big band, soundtrack, and personality recordings. We have movie posters, magazines, books, cards, games, some great jigsaw puzzles, a lot of gifts, and some novelties, too. It's all there, and it's waiting for you at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. You know what's coming up, don't you, on the, uh, on the 17th of June? That's Father's Day, and I'll bet you that there's a dad in your life uh, who would just love to get something nostalgic or something special at our MGM shop. A big band recording, or we've got some baseball cards there, some old baseball cards. We've got uh, all kinds of books on on uh, the stars. We've got a lot of books on Western heroes, or if uh, Dad is into the old serials, I don't mean Wheaties and Grape Nuts, but I mean the, the movie serials uh, that used to see on Saturdays. We've got books about that. We've got a lot of, lot of interesting things. We even have... Some, uh, we still have some of those uh, Maltese Falcon replicas on hand. Uh, you can pick those up over there at, at the MGM shop. We've found a nice source for that now, and so uh, that can be a little regular item with us. But uh, there's so many good things for Dad at the MGM shop that uh, you'll really want to uh, stop over there and snoop around, pay a visit. And if, even if you don't know exactly what he might like, what you ought to do is steer him over there someday, maybe tomorrow afternoon or tonight sometime, and say, Dad, why don't you look around and uh, see if there's anything you like, and then let us know what it is you like, and then go out and wait in the car, you know. And then Dad goes out into the car, and you say, he wants this, I want to get that, I'll take this up. And then you can surprise him on, uh, on Father's Day, the big day. Not a bad idea, and it happens all the time at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. We're open seven days a week, Monday through Friday from 11 a.m. till 5 p.m., Saturdays from 11 until 7.30, and on Sundays from noon to 5. So why don't you come in? see all the goodies uh, for dad for mom for everybody uh, some good old nostalgic items at our metro golden memory shop you can use your master charge your visa card too at 5941 west irving park road just east of austin metro golden memories the mgm shop magic kiss the professionals in carpet rug and furniture cleaning have unclaimed rugs for sale twenty dollars and up at 800 south cicero avenue just one block south of the eisenhower expressway or at 121st and Western Avenue in Blue Island. All unclaimed rugs have been magic kiss clean and offer an excellent buy. 
Magikiss welcomes Visa and Master Charge. Remember, Magikiss cleans carpet, rugs, and furniture too. For pickup and delivery or for in home or office cleaning, call 378 8600. That's 378 8600. Or visit the Magikiss sales rooms at 800 South Cicero Avenue or 121st and Western, Monday through Fridays, 8 until 6 p.m., and Saturdays until 4. And don't forget to bring in your room measurements and ask Magikist about their layaway policy. You're tuned to WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. I'm Chuck Shaden. This is our regular Saturday afternoon get-together, our Those Were the Days program. And, uh, of course, we're continuing our look at that special day in history, 1939. Before we continue, Bob Kolosowski is with us again this afternoon in our studio. And uh, Bob has been coming by for the last several weeks to talk about movies, usually the films that are on television. Bob, we've gotten lots of... Uh, inquiries from people saying, enjoy what you're doing with, you know, talking about the movies on TV. Who is that fellow who, who comes <laughs> in? Who is that masked man? You know? <laughs> and uh, we've mentioned it, but I guess we, you know, we try to keep the pace moving. So uh, who are you? <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> I was born in a celluloid can. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, uh, I'm an architect, uh, but I love the movies, and I have mm -hmm. ever since uh, I, I could watch television. I'm a television baby, you can say, because I was born in the late 40s, and uh, I grew up with television. My first um, recollections, of, I guess, of anything are watching TV, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> unfortunately, maybe. But and that's uh, probably where you saw most of the uh, the movies that you enjoy so much today, yes, right? I, in fact, um, a lot of movie that I, movies that I saw when I was very young, they don't even show anymore. They mm -hmm. had quite a few um, B-Westerns, a lot of um, uh, John Wayne Westerns, and Bob Steele westerns that uh, I remember Jim Moran, the Courtesy Man, mm. <laughs> uh, you know, showing on a Friday or Saturday right. night. I watched a lot of those. Remember and the Sergeant Doubleday movies? No, so I you don't. don't remember those. That's no. even before your time. I guess so. <laughs> but uh, uh, and then I I just progressed into just just a movie fanatic. I just um, mm -hmm. in fact I had very few friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be home watching TV all day long. Uh -huh. But. Uh, uh, and uh, I was still back in there in the good old days when you can go see a double feature on Saturday for a quarter. Yeah. And uh, my mother would gladly give me the quarter, and I would go Getting and... Getting ready out of the house. Well, I, well, I want to say that, but that's <laughs> probably the truth. And I would go, and I'd watch uh, a double feature mm -hmm. and, and the cartoons and the whole bit, and I loved it, and I still do. You know, So that's how I got into it. And now you've done uh, some work professionally with the movies, haven't you, writing about the, well, the for films? For about two years, I wrote for the Tribune mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the TV Week magazine. Uh -huh. In the back, I was the one who gave you the four stars, three stars, two and a half. That's right. And uh, wrote the little synopsis back there for all the movies. But I've, uh, I've quit doing that, but uh, it doesn't diminish my, my love for the movies one bit. Well, how, does, uh, uh, how, do, how do you relate your interest in the movies uh, to your career as an architect? <laughs> you don't, huh? You don't. <laughs> you, just, you just do the... You know. um, to be honest with you, you know, um, uh, watching movies, and, and my big passion is reading about movies. Mm -hmm. and I've read probably a hundred, more than 100 books about movies. It's a kind of a release. Uh, you know, it, make, it relaxes me, mm -hmm. and it kind of puts me in another world. And uh, so it really is uh, w how I stay calm. <laughs> well, that's good. Well, that's, you yeah. know, we find that I find the same thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Doing this kind of a program and uh, getting involved in the radio uh, programs. And I think a lot of our people who listen to, uh, to us on Saturdays say, hey, this is, a, this is a, if not an escape, uh, at least it's a, a place to go to uh, forget about what's happening mm -hmm. uh, in the outside world. That's right. And, yeah. and you have a little bit of personal special satisfaction with the things. And so um, I can relate to that a lot, too. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I know that many of our people can, too. Well, we've been talking so much about uh, 1939 in this last that wonderful radio year. month, right? Yeah, the year that of the, our complete broadcast day. I thought today, instead of talking about the movies that are going to come up on the television tube this in the week ahead, we might talk a little bit about movies from uh, 1939 and the movie scene. And uh, so, what was the movie scene in 1939? I think it was tremendous. <laughs> 1939. Uh, had the big movies like uh, Gone with the Wind, The Wizard mm -hmm. of Oz, but it also had uh, quite a few uh, smaller movies, but nevertheless good movies. And a few that come to mind are um, uh, The Roaring Twenties with James Cagney and Humphrey Bogart was a 1939 production. And it's a great movie. Uh, and then it also had the series, you know, the Andy Hardy series uh -huh. was running strong in 1939. And uh, also uh, Shirley Temple was 
was was still a big box office star in 1939. Well, the, uh, MGM wanted Shirley Temple to be uh, Dorothy. to be Dorothy in right. the Wizard of Oz, and 20th Century Fox says no. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. knew that if they if they lost her even for one picture, I thought uh, they probably thought that it would just uh, ruin their whole system mm -hmm. with her. Mm -hmm. So you know that the G you probably did know. I just heard this recently uh, that Metro was willing to trade Clark Gable. That's right. Uh, mm -hmm. And Gene Harlow to Fox for Shirley Temple. For Shirley Temple. Yeah. So that's that's the weight she held. In fact, in 1939, she was the number one in the box office. They had what they call the top ten box office mm -hmm. stars, and I have the list here. She was number one. Clark Gable was number two, and Sonia Henney and her ice skates uh -huh. <laughs> were number yeah. three. She was 20th Century Fox also. Mickey Rooney was number four. Metro. Metro. Spencer Tracy was number five. Metro. <laughs> Robert Taylor was number six. Now Metro again, right? And Myrna Loy was number... Metro. Metro. Yeah. And then Jane Withers was number uh, seven. Now who was no, she? I'm number eight, I'm sorry. Jane Withers. What studio was she? She was with 20th Century Fox. Fox. Oh, boy. And Alice Faye was number nine. With, with Fox also. With Fox and later on with Phil Harris. <laughs> <laughs> And number 10 was Tyrone Power, who was with 20th Century Fox. My God, you mean so the top 10, out of the top 10 stars right, in 1939, it was either 20th Century Fox or Metro Golden Mayor? Or Metro Golden Mayor. Yeah, that's something I hadn't realized, but uh, there it was. So they were do those two studios yeah. were doing a good business. And uh, uh, that was the top 10. So Shirley Temple was right there on top. And I think she was on top for about three, four years in a row, number one. Now, after Gable then appeared in Gone with the Wind that year, then he, he was number one, wasn't yes, he? Yes, he was, yeah. And in years, uh, last week we were talking about Bing Crosby, and Crosby was the number one box office in draw the, in the middle 40s. In there the middle 40s, in during, during the war, he was and, very, very yeah. big, yeah. yeah. So he was doing really good in the 40s. Of course, Gable was in the service during the war, too, so yeah, he after took him out of circulation. Yeah, he went to the service, yeah. and, and he was out of circulation. He came back when the war ended to, to go back uh -huh. into films. Mm -hmm. Another interesting thing about uh, what happened in 1939, for the first time in Academy Award history, three major winners of Academy Awards were repeaters. And one was Betty Davis, who won uh, for her uh, performance in Jezebel. In 39. Yeah, 1939. Now, and what had she been before? Uh, she won an Academy Award for Dangerous in 1935. Oh, okay. okay. Which was uh, a Warner Brothers, it was a Warner mm -hmm. Brothers production, mm -hmm. the melodrama. But she was good in it, and she won an mm -hmm. Academy Award. And then uh, Spencer Tracy won for uh, Boys Town. And then he had won the year previous to that for uh, Captain's Courageous. So he won two years in a oh, row. Two in a row, yeah. And then uh, Frank, Frank Capra won for Best Director in uh, You Can't Take It With You. And he had won twice previous to that, and it happened one night, and Mr. Deed goes to town. Mm. So he was back mm. again. So. so it was a good year for, for those three people in particular. But the whole, I think the, um, the Depression was winding down. And I think the movies as a whole were winding up. And, uh -huh. of course, during the, uh, the war years, the movie business was a boom. Uh, in fact, they said you could have filmed anything, and people came to see it, yeah. you know, and they would have made money on it. So, so th And 39 was kind of just on the threshold of that tremendous uh, uh, warrior boom in Hollywood when things really geared up, and they were gearing up in 39. So although 20th Century Fox and uh, Metro seemed to have, have the top ten stars, I think... Uh, if you look to, to studios like Paramount, they had Bob Hope and they had W.C. Field at mm -hmm. the time. And they had, uh, well, Bing Crosby, of course. You know, they were doing fine. And then Warner Brothers with their stock company with uh, Errol Flynn and, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, Humphrey Bogart. You know, they were doing fine. So it was a good year for movies. You know. uh, what other? We had uh, Columbia. <coughs> Columbia in, in 1939 was... Uh, you know, the interesting thing yeah. about Columbia Studios is that for a long, long time, and I think in, even in 1939, they didn't have a stock company of stars. <laughs> they had Glenn Ford, I think, maybe in 1939. Mm -hmm. But they, what they would do is they would borrow stars from studios to come in and make movies. Like mm -hmm. uh, Frank Capra was, you know, at Columbia. And he borrowed, you know, Gary Cooper, and he yeah. borrowed um, uh, James Stewart, you know, to come in and make a movie. And they would be there for one movie. And the same thing with Clark Gable when he made it happened one night. He was borrowed for one movie. Mm -hmm. So Columbia didn't have the overhead. <laughs> you know, they were yeah. they were uh, a budgeted studio. So they And they were they were there too then to, to help actually help out the other studios as That's they right. when they were looking for a new a property for somebody like that. And, and they had well a they had a little time and yeah. they had already they had them on the payroll, so sure. to speak, and they said, Well I, I shouldn't mention this, but like uh uh, most studios, let's say they were paying a, a star three thousand dollars a week, when they mm -hmm. rented them to Columbia or some other studio, they they actually rented them. They mm -hmm. would get 
and they would make money on it. They would rent them for five or six thousand uh-huh. dollars a week, and they would pick up a few extra thousand. Uh-huh. You know. So, but when Gable would go to another studio, he was getting actually getting paid by uh, by his home studio. That's right. He was on con- he was under contract for a set amount. Uh-huh. Actually, he never got rented out after it happened one night. That was the last time he got rented out. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Louis Mirrors over there, you know, hitting his head against yeah. the wall. Why did I do that? But it helped them because uh, oh, the sure. mo- movie was so tremendously popular, made him so tremendously mm-hmm. popular. So uh, Columbia, they helped each other. Well, Columbia was making a lot of series movies too, weren't they? Yeah, the Blondie series, yeah. and uh, they had they had a lot of the detective series, mm-hmm. and, and they were into that quite a bit. But they had. Uh, Frank Capra gave them a lot of class with his productions, mm-hmm. and I think he really kept them afloat for a long, long time in the 30s there. Also, we had uh, Republic was going strong in, well, Republic, in the 30s, uh, 39. Yeah, in 39, uh, 39 was the year of Stagecoach, by uh-huh. the way, and that made John Wayne a star. Uh-huh. So uh, they had John Wayne, and, and he was, after Stagecoach, he was their premier star, and he uh, kept their studio going for a long time. Of course, in the Warriors, like I said, everybody's making money. Republic mm-hmm. was one of them, but uh, uh, he was in a series of B features through the 30s, and in 39 he hit, you know, Stagecoach, which made him, you know, top star, and uh, was a boom to uh, to Republic Studios. So, you know, I get out to California occasionally now, and I I'm irresistibly drawn to those studios, and no, I, I am too. I've any, been out there twice. Yeah. I don't have any special pass to get through the studios, but I get over there and I look at. Uh, you know, you look at that fantastic Paramount Gate, you yeah. know, that you've yeah. seen so many times yeah. in the pictures, and you you stand and you take a picture of it and you look at it, and uh, I cannot help but uh, just kind of fantasize myself back in the, into the 1940s and say, geez, I would love to be standing there at that same spot on any day in, the, in the 1939 or 1940 yeah. or so, and just, you know... I have a, a mental image of Hope and Crosby driving <laughs> up, you know, and walk, waving to the guard and the guy passing and walking, driving in. Yeah, you know. I'd like to see him come in in a camel from Rosa Morocco <laughs> <laughs> singing a song. Yeah. I have this, I've been out there twice and I've been to the mm-hmm. studio. I went to all the studios mm-hmm. to visit them all and I have the, the same fantasy yeah. you know, and, and the same reaction. I just would have loved to have been there and see them when they were in their prime, you know. Yeah, it's a it's a wonderful way to uh, to... Well, you know, you are, and I am, and so many people who tune into this program are great movie fans. And some some people, some of us are super, super buffs and know everything, and others are just casual fans who enjoy the stars and the and the performances and the, and the films. But the movies have played a big part in everybody's life, and if you enjoy those films... You, you, you enjoy knowing about them and getting into it. And uh, as we say so many times about the radio shows and the movies and things, we we really don't study them as much as we enjoy them. And getting a little bit of background information and all that sort of thing is, is part of the enjoyment of the radio shows and of the right. movies. Yeah. And that's why we appreciate you stopping in uh, well, and chatting with us. I love, to, do with us, love, uh, to, do I love to talk about movies. Well, and my wife is tired of listening to me, <laughs> so you're stuck. <laughs> Just the thousands of us who are here, uh, and your wife can turn it off, right? (laughs) (laughs) That's one thing about being on the radio. Someone (laughs) can turn you off if they don't. That's right. (laughs) I hope they don't. We won't turn you off. As a matter of fact, we hope you you turn us on to enjoying good movies some more. Bob Kolosowski, appreciate you you being here again today, and we'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Wilmette. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you'll find quality merchandise for the entire family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center. Easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Shop and save for dad and grad seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, Wilmette. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program. Thanks, Bob. Happy to have you in today. And uh, we're on WNIB Chicago at FM 97. Well, Jimmy Durante and Gary Moore, the nose and the haircut, are on the cover of our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide for June, and that's uh, only the front page of our guide to the good old days. A year subscription, 10 issues, is just $7, and you can subscribe right now when you call us at 545-2260. The June issue has a 1940 article about the Green Hornet, a 1942 story about dancer Ann Miller, and the 1946 look at comedian Henry Morgan. That's just some of the good reading and good entertainment you'll find in our Nostalgia Newsletter for June. Why don't you subscribe right now? Call us this minute 
at 545-2260. You'll get some letters from listeners, advanced news of our Saturday night movies and special events at Northwest Federal, plus the complete schedule of our Saturday afternoon, those were the day's programs here on WNIB. Call 545-2260 to subscribe. We'll begin your subscription with the June issue, which we'll mail to you by first-class mail at the beginning of the week, and we'll include an invoice along with your first copy. The Nostalgia Newsletter gives you lots of information about the shows we play, including original broadcast dates, names of stars and other cast members, network and sponsor identification, even the times of each segment we present. In case you're recording the shows for your own collection, this will help. It's all there, the complete listing, plus lots of other good reading, and it's all yours when you become a subscriber to our Nostalgia Newsletter and Radio Guide. A one-year subscription is $7. You can sign up now when you call us here at our studio at 545 2260. If you like, you can send $7 to Nostalgia Newsletter Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. But why not call us now at 545 2260? <laughs> Radio, brought back once more by Mark 56 Records. What wonderful memories. Relive them again with The Shadow, The Lone Ranger, The Green Hornet, Burns and Allen. You can buy these and over 100 other original radio broadcasts on Mark 56 LP Records, a gift for remembering. Major Bowes, Tarzan, The Whistler. Hundreds of old-time radio shows on record, cassette, and 8-track tape are available at our Metro Golden Memory Shop, 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. We're open Monday through Friday from 11 till 5, Saturday till 7.30, and Sunday from noon to 5. Use your Master Charge or Visa card at Metro Golden Memories, the MGM shop. Fred McDonald is with us this afternoon as we've been listening in to uh, the sounds of 1939. And that, of course, was uh, just one year in the golden age of broadcasting. Fred, how do you perceive the so-called golden age of radio? When, when, uh, when was it? Oh, roughly, <coughs> excuse me, it would probably be about 1932, uh, mainly, although radio had been around throughout the 1920s, but in the sense in 1932, there was a tremendous inundation of commercial radio by some of the biggest names in vaudeville and from uh, motion pictures. Mainly, I think they were, they were um, led to radio because of the Depression, which had helped to help destroy vaudeville, help cut down on audiences mm -hmm. and backing mm -hmm. for Broadway shows. And they'd also seen the success of one of their peers in 1931, when Eddie Cantor had entered with his Chase and Sanborn program into radio, something which they had always sort of looked down their nose at. And Cantor had been so successful that by early 32, he was the number one show in the country. Uh, Amos and Andy had already started to uh, to wane in popularity, and the Eddie Cantor success showed other people, his friends, just what they could do. So that in the fall of 1932, you have probably the greatest new season in the history of American entertainment. For 1932, I can't remember all of them, but Fred Allen began his radio mm -hmm. career, Burns and Allen, uh, Ed Wynn, uh, Jack Benny, Paul Robeson. Uh, Ruth Edding, Bing Crosby in 32 came to radio, uh, Jack Pearl came to radio in 32, the Marx Brothers started a radio career in 32. Absolutely the, the, the greatest lineup of talent to ever come as neophytes, as newcomers, to uh, broadcast entertainment in one particular season. And so many of those people lasted for so many years. Oh, absolutely. You know. I mean, Jack Benny, for instance. <laughs> well, to he me, lasted you know. to the end of radio. You, you said <laughs> that Amos and Andy were waning a little bit, yet Amos and Andy continued to be extremely big on radio all through the 30s and the 40s and even into the 50s. Yeah, well, by waning, I, I meant that uh, mm. their incredible popularity where half the listening audience would tune them uh -huh. in in, thir in 1929, 1930, that had slipped off, and they were no longer the number one show in the country. Uh, in fact, uh, they, they, were, they were downhill throughout the 30s, and in 1943, 
they had to change their format to become a situation comedy, mm -hmm. and they brought uh, other people into the series with them in '43. Well, that's when they went went to the half hour with Rinso and the and the, right. the studio audience right. and all of that. But you know, really, and when I don't by no means do I mean to put Amos and Andy down as a as a radio show, but they almost had the market cornered up to before 1932, as you suggest. I mean, they were. They were they were there when none of these other people were there. Then you start diluting it a little bit by adding Jimmy, uh, Eddie Cantor, and Bing Crosby, and Ed Wynn, and all of these other yeah. folks. Well, they were strong mm -hmm. rivals. You're right. Yeah. You're right. There were few great rivals. Rudy Valley started mm -hmm. in '29. Mm -hmm. uh, the rise of the Goldbergs, the Molly Goldberg, uh, that started in 1929. Uh, Easy Aces had been around since about '31. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lum and Abner started early. There were a few shows, but for the most part, you know, they were the kingpins. A large uh, review of the golden age of radio is uh, the subject of your your new book coming out. It's called Don't Touch That Dial, and it's published by Nelson Hall, and it's due late later this month, right? Right. It's a st uh, lengthy study of radio in terms of the programming. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not just a chart of what shows are on the air. It's a study of the programming and how that programming reflected um, American social values, uh, how it changes uh, with the various times, and uh, and how within itself it has its own history, but also it has a history as a social reflection. What are some of the segments in, in the book, some of the chapters? Well, I have a very lengthy historical chapter, which in a sense helps to set uh, it all in a framework covering radio from 1920 to 1960, roughly the end of, uh, end of the trail for mm -hmm. our type of radio. Then I have chapters on specific topics. There'll be a chapter on radio comedy, a chapter on the detective, on soap operas, on broadcast journalism or news, uh, a chapter on blacks in radio, and uh, a chapter on the radio western. Well, that covers pretty much of everything, doesn't it? That, as far as the good, most popular programming is concerned. Yes, I, mm -hmm. I think it uh, covers hundreds of different shows and, and uh, quotes from shows, quotes from fan magazines, and uh, has some interesting ideas. And I think an interesting uh, uh, perspective to look at our what most of us see as just mm -hmm. nostalgia, what, uh, but to see it actually as an important uh, reflection of our historical past. It's nice that another good book on radio is due because there are so few and far in between. And mm -hmm. I'm uh, hopeful, uh, knowing you and knowing uh, your interest and uh, dedication to all of this, I'm hopeful that this will uh, become a classic in the annals of uh, uh, <laughs> literature on radio. <coughs> We're going to have it uh, at our Metro Golden Memory Shop. And as I've said before, I want you to uh, plan, Fred, to stop over at the shop some afternoon and we'll have kind of an autograph uh, session over there Fine. and uh, people can pick up your book which will sell in um, hardcover or cloth for 15.95 and there's a paper edition of it for 8.95 we're going to have both uh, editions available at our shop and uh, that by no means is the only place where you can pick up a copy of the book when it comes out we will let you know and um, uh, you'll want to get a copy of the book by Fred McDonald. It's called Don't Touch That Dial, published by Nelson Hall, and it's due out later this month, correct? Right. The end of June is what they told me. Okay. Now, that little conversation is going to be followed by a musical interlude, believe it or not. You know, we always kidded about radio, uh, that they would have a musical interlude. Uh, and uh, the most famous radio program of all, The War of the World, has these little musical interludes in it as, the, as Orson Welles was creating had to have some sound for the listener while they were trying to fill, figure out what Carl Phillips and the others were doing out of Grover's Mill with the landing of the Martians, you know. Now the baseball has ended, and uh, it ended at 5.17 in the afternoon, and so they're filling now until 5.30 with a music uh, musical interlude featuring Dick Carroll, his piano, and the orchestra. So we're going back now to that broadcast day of September 21st of 1939, the CBS station in Washington, D.C., WJSV.
dancers. And we present the transcribed music of Dick Carroll, his piano, and his orchestra. We present a program of dancing tunes played by top-ranking radio orchestras. Dick opens his quarter hour with Boulevard of Broken Dreams. If you need money, it's the business of the Equitable Credit Company, 1321 New York Avenue, to see that you get it. To loan you money quickly, confidentially, and with no red tape. No matter what you need money for, if it's in the amount of from $50 to $1,000, and if you have a car, go to Equitable Credit Company, 1321 New York Avenue, and Mr. Burns will give you the cash. Your car need not be paid for. Equitable will reduce the payments and give you additional cash. Get the money now. Take from one to 20 months to pay. Drive to Equitable Credit Company, 1321 New York Avenue today. Tell Mr. Burns how much money you want and drive away with the cash. Mary Larkin sings as Dick Carroll and the orchestra recall another favorite of past seasons, the waltz, Love Me Forever. Thank you. 
With our maestro at the piano, his Oceans of Time, Dick Carroll and his music.
Transcribed music for a dancing world comes to you tomorrow at the same time played by Reed Murray, his trombone, and his orchestra. This is Columbia Station for the nation's capital. Fine. Housewives praise the wholesome goodness and economy of jumbo bread. Yet jumbo bread sells at the economical price of 8 cents a pound loaf, 15 cents for two full pound loaves at your neighborhood sanitary food store. WJSV, Washington. I think they'd like to run over there and get some of that bread, huh? 15 cents for two pound loaves of bread. Those were the days. <laughs> That's uh, a musical interlude, believe it or not. I told you uh, we would have everything from the schedule on this broadcast day from September 21st of 1939. It's 5.30 now in Washington, D.C. on that date, WJSV, the CBS station there. In reality, this is a Saturday afternoon, 40 years later on WNIB in Chicago, FM 97. I'm Chuck Shaden, and we're tuning in to this complete broadcast day from 1939 from our nation's capital. We have a news broadcast, a little five-minute news broadcast, and another little uh, musical and organ music interlude coming up. And then, of course, we've got some sports news, and then Amos and Andy, their 6 o'clock show for Campbell Soup, and the Parker family as we begin the, uh, the prime time shows uh, from this day in 1939. Right now, we have for you a clip from our cassette tape of the month for June, a real prime time show. This is from the Lux Radio Theater, and it's a 1952 broadcast of The African Queen, starring Humphrey Bogart and Greer Garson. It's, uh, it's something to matter, please. Uh, I must know. It's nothing you'd understand. You're, you're drinking gin again, Mr. Allnut. Yes, miss, I sure am. It's been such a pleasant day up until now. What is it that, that's driving you to drink, Mr. Allnut? All right. I'll tell you. It's all your foolish talk about us going on into the lake, all this crazy talk about the Louise. Well, we ain't gonna go. But of course we are. What an absurd idea. What an absurd idea. What an absurd idea. Why don't you want to go on? Because of the river and the rapids and then Shona. Shona? Oh, yes, yes. Where the Germans have a fort. Yeah, you're darn right, Shona. Just one bullet in that blasting gelatin missing. We'd be a little bits and pieces. Then we'll go by the fort at night. Oh, no, we won't. Then we'll go by day. We can go on the far side of the river, speeding along just as fast as ever oh, we can. Oh, I'm going to go speeding along any place. <gasps> you agreed to go. I never did. I never agreed to anything. Mr. Allnut, you are a liar. And what is worse than that? A, a coward. No! <laughs> coward yourself. You ain't no lady. No, miss, that's what my poor old mother would say to you. My poor old mother would say to you. Whose boat is this, anyway? I asked John because I was sorry for you. That's what you get for feeling sorry for people. Well, I ain't sorry for you anymore. You're a crazy, psalm-singing, dried-up old maid. Mr. Allnut, you are drunk. You're not half what I've got to beat, either. <laughs> there was a bold fisherman set sail for Port Pimlico. To catch the ball, Peggy and the gay back. That's a nice scene from the African Queen, as heard on the Lux Radio Theater broadcast of December 15th, 1952. Humphrey Bogart uh, hamming it up for the audience a little bit there, maybe. Well, it's our cassette tape of the month for June. This broadcast stars Bogey with Greer Garson, Hans Conried, in the radio version of the Academy Award winning 1952 motion picture. It's yours for just $5 this month from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Or you can pick up this tape at any office of Northwest Federal Savings or when you visit our Metro Golden Memory Shop at 5941 West Irving Park Road, just east of Austin. The Lux Radio Theater presents Humphrey Bogart in The African Queen, a very fine performance and a very good broadcast. It's a classic. It's yours for just $5 from the Hall Closet, Box 421, Morton Grove, 60053. Our cassette tape for June. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where you can shop with confidence for all the family. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, where Eden's Expressway, Skokie Boulevard, and Lake Avenue meet at Wilmette. Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, easy to reach, easy to park, easy to shop. Quality plus value, seven days a week at Eden's Plaza Shopping Center, Will Met.
This is Chuck Shaden on our Those Were the Days program, WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Fred McDonald, we're going uh, We're going to hear a news broadcast now. This is a, a little five-minute news broadcast at uh, 5.30. This station was not really known, although they gave a great chunk of time for um, the coverage of the FDR speech, as we heard last week. It was really not known for any great regular newscast. We had one early in the morning, and I think we had one at 1 o'clock, and and now here we are at 5.30 again, and all we have is five minutes of news. I guess that's right. all they were looking for at that time. Um, it's, it's interesting, too, because uh, we, we perhaps have forgotten the solemn quality of the, of the time by listening to the baseball game and, and, and talking about uh, people's uh, hitting records and pitching records. But there's a war going on in Europe that's only three weeks old. The president, only a few hours earlier, had... Uh, proposed radical changes in America's foreign policy and its relationship to the uh, countries that were at war. Uh, America was taking a uh, first step toward the eventual commitment uh, uh, that she would uh, entertain in late 1941. And this newscast, I think, is going to bring it all right back to us. Later on in the evening, or in, in a week or so on, on your program, you're going to be playing Elmer Davis who was uh, one of the premier CBS commentators and um, uh, newsmen, uh, uh, so prestigious that he actually uh, worked for the U.S. government during World War II as the, uh, the head of the Office of War Information. But um, no, we don't have any, uh, any great uh, names in, uh, in news broadcasting. Uh, and we don't really don't have an awful lot of news, you know, just a little bit here and there. Incidentally, in this newscast that you're going to hear now, the newscast runs five minutes, and then they have another uh, an organ music interlude that follows with some commercials and some other little things in there. Uh, we're going to hear from Zlotniks again, uh, one of the f renowned furriers. But in the newscast, <laughs> they, they mention that the FDR speech is going to be rebroadcast later in the day. And indeed, at 10.45 in the evening of this broadcast day, September 21st, they rebroadcast uh, the FDR speech and not all of the, um, the other things that were heard around it, the introductions and all that, but they do a, about a 36-minute uh, rebroadcast of FDR speech. Now, when we get to that point in time, we're not going to rebroadcast it since we played it last week. We will not rebroadcast it, but they talk about it in this uh, news. So let's go back now to it's 5.30 in the evening on September 21st of 1939, station WJSV in Washington. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is your Arrow News reporter with last-minute hit-the-spot news brought to you four times daily through the courtesy of Arrow Beer and Ale. Arrow Beer, the fine beer that brings you this broadcast, has always been a big favorite in Washington, and it's growing more popular each day, is making more friends than any other brand of beer that's sold in the city. Arrow beer is growing faster because it has the famous flavor that real beer drinkers appreciate. Arrow is smooth, not sweet. Better, not bitter. The sharp bark of assassin's guns sounded above the thunder of artillery today and gave Europe grave new fears. A group of pro-Nazi Romanians shot and killed the premier of their pivotal Balkan state, armed Kamsku. The assassins then attacked the Bucharest radio station and shouted what seemed to be a signal into the microphone. Quick action by Romanian guards restored order, and the government now announces that the nation is calm. If the murder of Calanescu was intended to touch off a general revolt by the pro-Nazi Romanian Iron Guard, it apparently has failed. Advices from various Romanian embassies indicate the government is in control, and a military dictatorship is likely. Washington and the Berlin embassies both understand that General Ernst Balif has been named premier. The assassination came as all Europe followed Romania's position carefully, knowing that her oil and wheat are coveted by Hitler. The destruction of Poland has brought German and Russian troops almost to Romania's borders. For the moment, at least, Romanian developments overshadow the shifting of millions of soldiers on the Western Front. But after five days of lull, the Rhineland sector is again the scene of major developments. Nazi artillery is pounding French lines in the Saar and Vos sectors. An unofficial French communique admits enemy fire south of the Saarbrücken, but says that the day was generally calm. France has completed general mobilization with six million men geared for action. Apparently fearing a renewed French drive, now that mobilization is complete, the Germans opened fire with artillery. 
Neutral observers believe the barrage is intended to hold the Allies in check until German reserves complete their migration from Poland to the Western Front. Heavy German troop movements have been underway for two days. Behind the battle lines, all Europe looked eagerly to America as the historic debate on neutrality revision began. As expected, the President asked for repeal of the arms embargo in exchange for a policy of cash and carry munitions sales to belligerents. Great Britain warmly received the President's message, which, if carried out by Congress, will help the Allies. In Rome, meanwhile, fascist newspapers printed peace editorials believed aimed at Mr. Roosevelt and the American Congress. They suggested that the present moment might be the last chance to prevent a destructively long war. In Paris, Premier Duladier told his people that France, as well as Poland, has been marked for dismemberment by the Nazis. He spoke of German maps showing France amputated and said the Nazis are trying to incite treason in Alsace and Brittany. Duladier said Poland was destroyed by a deal made in advance by Germany and Russia. Simultaneously in London, England made public a blue book showing that as early as August 16th, the Nazis were confident that Russia would join them in splitting up Poland. This was one week before the German-Russian non-aggression pact was signed. Because of the fact that President Roosevelt's message to Congress was of such vital importance, and because thousands of Washingtonians were unable to hear the speech when it was broadcast over the Columbia network this afternoon, WJSV will rebroadcast the entire speech from transcriptions beginning at 10.45 tonight. Here's a late bulletin from Bucharest, which states that General George Argenshaw, commander of the Bucharest Army Corps and former Minister of War, has been named Premier, replacing the slain Premier Amon Kalinescu. Listen in again for the Arrow News Reporter, brought to you by the Globe Brewing Company of Baltimore, at 10 o'clock this evening. And remember, when you order beer, be sure to ask for Arrow, the beer with the famous flavor. This is Columbia Station for the nation's capital. The following announcement is electrically transcribed. All rumors about 1940 cars add up to this. Best bets, Buick. Your nearest Buick dealer can give you the inside story. Let's take time out, ladies and gentlemen. Time out with Johnny Saab at the console of the Hammond Electric Organ. Johnny opens this evening's program with an excerpt from Porgy and Bess. Summertime.
prices on imported goods are going up. Furs, for example. Insurance rates for transporting furs from Central Europe have jumped 3,000%. Imagine the effect on fur prices. Zlotnik the furrier is prepared. Months ago, Mr. Zlotnik bought heavily of the choicest imported fur pelts. And now these gorgeous furs are available at Zlotnik's at original price levels. If you mean to buy a new fur coat, be forewarned by this good advice from Zlotnik the Furrier. Now is the time to buy your furs. Gorgeous furs, original prices, at Zlotnik's individual terms. Zlotnik the Furrier, at the sign of the big white bear, 12th and G Street. <laughs> Johnny turns now to No No Nanette and brings us that sprightly hit tune from the production, T for Two. Because of the importance of President Roosevelt's address to Congress, we'd like to remind you again that the transcription of the talk will be broadcast over WJSV at 10.45 this evening for the benefit of those of our listeners who are unable to hear it at the time of its original delivery. fingers of Johnny Saab bring us now one of the season's best ballads, White Sails. In response to numerous requests, Johnny Saab now complies and plays his theme song in entirety.
nothing to be desired. For the past ten minutes, ladies and gentlemen, you've been taking time out with Johnny Saab, who has been performing at the console of the Hammond Electric Organ. Johnny will be back again tomorrow evening at this same time. Hugh Conover speaking. This is Columbia Station for the nation's capital. W.J.S.V. Washington. Now, you hear that little organ interlude there was not uh, uh, an interlude of music that just uh, they used to fill. That was a planned program that they had uh, organ music every, uh, every day at 535 on that Washington, D.C. station. This is Chuck Shaden with our Those Were the Days program, WNIB Chicago at FM 97, looking back at a day in history from radio station WJSV, Thursday, September 21st of 1939. If you haven't had a chance to see the new Betamax videotape recorder by Sony, why don't you pay a visit to Townhouse TV and Appliances for a complete demonstration of an exciting new way to watch and save television. You can watch one show while you're recording another, and you can watch that anytime you want then. Or while you're asleep, or you're out of the house, or you're away, busy doing something, the Sony Automatic Timer will record your favorite program or a special while you're away from the set. It's the Betamax videotape recording system by Sony. See it at Townhouse TV and Appliances, 7243 Tui Avenue, just west of Harlem. They'll be pleased to show you the Sony videotape recorder. They're open Monday, Thursday, and Friday nights till 9, Saturday until 5. <laughs> That's the popular Peg of My Heart, as performed by Jerry Murad's Harmonicats uh, quite a few years ago. Well, the Harmonicats are still going strong, and they're going to be at Northwest Federal Savings next weekend, next Friday and Saturday evening at 8 o'clock, and next Sunday, two performances on uh, the 10th of June at 2 o'clock and at 6 o'clock. Now, about a week or two ago, we had said that all the tickets for the Saturday performance were sold out, and uh, some of the members of the Kiwanis Club of Park Ridge, are, who are selling tickets for this, as well as Northwest Federal, have uh, discovered that they weren't all sold, and they turned a number of tickets back to Northwest Federal. So we do have tickets for next Saturday evening. About 50 seats are left yet, I believe, for next Saturday. And there are plenty of seats left for next Friday evening or uh, the two shows next Sunday. The 8th, 9th, and 10th, the Harmonicats will be on the stage at Northwest Federal Savings, and on the screen... A beautiful, beautiful film, Cover Girl, starring Rita Hayworth and Gene Kelly. It's a fantastic Technicolor from 1944, and I had a sneak preview of that print, and it's outstanding. It's, the great, it's that great, vivid Technicolor from the middle 1940s. So it's a fantastic double feature next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday at Northwest Federal. Tickets to each of the four performances is $5 per person. Proceeds go to uh, recognized charities, the Kiwanis Club of Park Ridge, and you can pick up your tickets in advance at any office of Northwest Federal Savings. So check with uh, the nearest office to you. There are 11 offices now in all Chicagoland. Pick up your tickets at any office of Northwest Federal and have a great time with a stage and screen show next weekend at Northwest Federal. We'll be there to MC too, so I hope that you will join us. If you're coming to the memory movie tonight, over at Northwest Federal to see the, uh, the double feature, Blondie's Lucky Day and Mallory Queen Master Detective. We'll have tickets available tonight, and you can pick them up uh, right on the spot this evening if you'd like to see this uh, show. And it's well worth it. $5 is, uh, you can't get an evening's worth of entertainment like that anywhere for that kind of uh, money. So I hope you will enjoy it, and uh, hope you will pop over to Northwest Federal next weekend to see the Harmonicats on stage live and uh, Gene Kelly and Rita Hayworth in Cover Girl on the screen. Fred McDonald is our guest uh, this afternoon, as he has been the last several weeks. And uh, Fred, now we're at another point in the broadcast day. This is uh, for Dad now coming home from work, I would suppose, about quarter to six o'clock in the uh, afternoon, because we have a sports cast now, a sports uh, program. 
quite obviously it was intended for uh, sports has usually been programmed for for males so quite obviously mm. it was intended for uh, just exactly that uh, in fact the day's work is done uh, the men are coming home and uh, the little woman in the kitchen all as all the stereotypes go has got dinner <laughs> ready and um, dad's going to settle down and maybe even relax before he has dinner at six o'clock by listening to what's been happening in his favorite world of sports my mother would be in the kitchen <clears throat> she'd have an apron on an over-the-shoulder apron you know one of those with a tie in the back and we kind of scalloped edges on the apron and uh, uh, we had a kitchen stove that was a stove on legs it was up and there was the oven section was on the right side of it and then the burners were on the left side and you had the little knobs there like a switch that you turn on and the, the pilot light was there if the pilot would go out you'd have always had a little a little metal container on the wall someplace with matches with the wooden stick matches in there you know ohio yeah uh, ohio yeah and uh, my dad would come home from work my dad worked for a bank and he'd come home from work about this time i guess close to six o'clock anyway and he'd, he'd he'd come into the house and the first thing he would do he'd give my mother a kiss and then he'd look up on the refrigerator to see the mail because she would always put the mail up on, on the refrigerator on top of the the refrigerator was a little a little uh, uh a little radio we had that was our kitchen radio it was kind of ivory in color and we had a wooden kitchen table with oil cloth right the uh, <laughs> the oil cloth on there and you know under, i mentioned that stove the big stove it was a green uh stove green and green. like porcelain green and cream right yeah mm -hmm. and underneath the stove i would play all the time in the kitchen and i have my soldiers under there and the little mm -hmm. cars and all that and i was on the floor under my mother's feet all the time but that was a very warm, secure place to be on the floor, on the kitchen floor. My mother would be making dinner, and it would be a good spot. And I would go in there all the time, and I would play and close to the food. And <laughs> you know, that's the that's the the scene, and that's indelibly etched in my memory. Now, was that the, the what kind of a kitchen scene did you have as a as a young boy, Fred? Well, it wasn't. It, we, I didn't have a stove I could get under to start with. Oh, your stove was <laughs> a low-slung job, right? Yes, it was uh, on the floor, but it, it's basically the same, uh, uh, quite similar to what you're talking about. I think all of us had uh, uh, routines that build up in, in people's lives uh, from the as familiar as having to have the mail on top of the refrigerator. And uh, even today, people have to have things set up in little routines, and those routines are... Uh, become indelibly marked on our brains and certain things for instance uh, an old sports news program from 1939 mm. can trigger it all back <laughs> that's right we do go off on gossamer wings every once in a while well let's go back to the sports cast now sponsored by uh, a sponsor interested in uh, appealing to the male audience too, bf goodrich it's 545 in washington dc on september 21st 1939 <laughs> Presenting Harry McTighe, your good, rich sports reporter with up-to-the-minute news from the world of sports. These programs are made possible by the cooperation of your local good, rich dealers and good, rich Silvertown stores. And now, Harry McTighe. Thank you, Warren, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The New York Yankees took their third straight game from the Chicago White Sox this afternoon, winning out 5-2. to two. The Yankees scored five runs off ten hits. They made no errors. Chicago, two runs, eight hits, and one error. Russell and Dickey, the battery for New York. Dietrich, Brown, and Trash working for Chicago. Dietrich, the losing pitcher. Bill Dickey, Homan in the third inning with one on for the Yanks, and Joe Gordon in the third with nobody on. The Boston Red Sox beat the St. Louis Browns 6-2. to two. Boston, six runs, nine hits, no errors. St. Louis, two runs, seven hits, one error. Gale House and Dessertels for Boston. Kramer and Horshaney for St. Louis. Cronin Homer in the seventh with one on for Boston. Kramer Homer in the third with nobody on for St. Louis. And Neighbors in the seventh with nobody on. The Detroit Tigers beat out the Philadelphia Athletics seven to six. Detroit seven runs, 11 hits, two errors. Philadelphia six runs, 10 hits, three errors. Pippen, Rowe, Bridges, and York for Detroit with Rowe, the winning pitcher. Beckman and Hayes work for Philadelphia. Rudy York Homer in the eighth with nobody on. 
The Cleveland Indians beat the Washington Senators six to three. Cleveland six runs, nine hits, no errors. Washington three runs, seven hits, one error. Milner and Hensley for Cleveland. Bass, Karras, Guell, and Farrell for Washington. Charlie Gilbert homered in the seventh with one man on. The Boston Bees and the Pittsburgh Pirates played a doubleheader this afternoon with Pittsburgh winning both games. The first six to four. Pittsburgh six runs, eight hits, one error. Boston four runs, 12 hits, two errors. Johnny Gee and Sussy, the battery for Pittsburgh. Vigo, Callahan, and Macy working for Boston. In the second game, the Pirates scored seven runs off 10 hits, made one error. Boston, no runs, eight hits, and three errors. Swigart and Mueller, the battery for Pittsburgh. Posadell and Lopez working for Boston. Chuck Klein, home in the fourth with one on for Pittsburgh. The Chicago Cubs beat the New York Giants 9-3. Chicago, nine runs, 14 hits, no errors. New York, three runs, six hits, one error. Paso and Mancuso for Chicago. Larman, Melton, Brown, and Danning for New York. Larman, the losing pitcher. Hank Lieber, home in the first with two on for the Cubs. The Cincinnati Reds beat the Philadelphia Phils 8-3. to three. Cincinnati, eight runs, 13 hits, no errors. Philadelphia, three runs, 11 hits, one error. Derringer and Lombardi for Cincinnati. Paul Derringer getting his 23rd win of the season. For Philadelphia, it was Pearson, Kersick, and Warren. Pearson, the losing pitcher. Lonnie Fry, homer in the sixth with one on. Brooklyn and St. Louis. The Brooklyn Dodgers are leading the St. Louis Cardinals 5-4, to four, going into the last half of the ninth inning. Hamlin and Todd, the battery for Brooklyn. McGee started for St. Louis. He was relieved by Wylan in the seventh. Davis going in, uh, Wylan in the fifth, rather. Davis in the seventh, and Padgett, the catcher. Hamlin homered for Brooklyn in the third with nobody on, and Slaughter in the first with nobody on for the Cardinals. Motorists, it's only once in a blue moon that you hear about a really unusual offer. And this is one of those times, a chance to get a miniature reproduction of your own license plate with keychain attached for only 10 cents. Believe me, this keychain is a hit clear across the country. It's going like wildfire. Motorists everywhere want it. In fact, at the Goodrich Arena at the New York World's Fair, where Jimmy Lynch and his daredevil drivers are performing, people are standing in line waiting to get these keychains. And here's how you can get one, too. Just mail a letter to the B.F. Goodrich Company, station WJSB Washington, giving your name and address and license plate number, and enclose 10 cents in coin or stamps to cover cost of handling. There's no obligation, nothing to buy. Remember, this keychain has a miniature reproduction of your own license plate attached, made of brass with smooth corners with your own number. If you want to beat the rush, take my advice and mail your request to the B.F. Goodrich Company, station WJSV, Washington, with 10 cents in coin or stamps right away. Heavyweight champion Joe Lewis has a great deal of respect for the man who went 11 rounds with him last night. The Brown Bomber describes Bob Pastor as a tough game opponent. He admits that Pastor's gameness and boxing skill had him puzzled until a crashing right-hand blow ended the scheduled 20-round battle in the 11th round. Lewis's co-manager, John Roxborough, says Pastor shook up the champion a bit in the 8th round. Pastor, outweighed by more than 15 pounds, made a surprising comeback after being floored four times in the first round and once in the second by Lewis's dynamite-laden fist. He did a little of the running and backpedaling that carried him through 10 rounds with Lewis two years ago. In the 8th, ninth, and 10th rounds, he forced the fighting, and in the 8th round, he even made Lewis cover up and retreat. The beating he took in the early rounds, however, robbed Pastor of his strength in a whistling right-hander to the jaw early in the 11th round, put him on the floor for the count. After the fight, promoter Mike, Mike Jacobs announced that Pastor would probably be matched with Max Baer this winter, and later, he may meet Tony Galento for the doubtful privilege of fighting Lewis again. The New York Yankees are getting ready for their fourth straight World Series, but it won't seem like a World Series to any of the old-timers without old Iron Man Lou Gehrig anchored out there on first base. It wasn't so much that Lou was a colorful figure standing out there on the initial sack. It was more than he, that he was there giving the game all he had every minute, whether it was an exhibition or one of the many World Series games he's helped to win. None can deny that Henry Louis Gehrig left a good record behind him when he broke a skein of 2,130 consecutive games this year. His lifetime fielding average with the Yanks was 992, and his batting average was 338. He holds more records in the American League than we have time to tell you about. One was that he is tied with Babe Ruth in leading the league in home runs for 12 years. Gehrig was in Detroit on May the 2nd this year when he broke his Iron Man string, and significantly enough, Old Wally Pipp was in the stands at Griggs Stadium that day also. And Wally Pipp, to use his own words, knew the Iron Horse when he was a coach.
Pip was, an unha was as unhappy as Lou himself that day, even though he'd co he had cause to be jealous of Lou in former years. It was Pip's job that Lou Gehrig took back in 1925 when the Yankees were running along in seventh place. It happened like this. One day, Pip went into the clubhouse after batting practice and asked the trainer for an aspirin. Doc Wood suggested that Pip take a, a rest that day, adding, we'd let that kid Gehrig play first today. The kid did all right. He got in a couple of base knocks and had a perfect day in the field. He stayed in the next day for, and for many days thereafter. In fact, for 15 straight years. Gary had a couple of close calls, however, in maintaining his amazing endurance record. There was that time in Detroit when he was suffering from lumbago so badly that he wore an electric pad on his back until game time. He went into the game as leadoff man, sent a ball sailing over the second baseman's head. A runner was sent in, and Lou went home to bed. When he first went with the Yankees, he was making something like $2,000 a year. His top was $36,000. And all told, in 15 years, the Yankees shelled him $386,000 out of the money sack. Perhaps the Yanks don't need Lou Gehrig to help them win the World Series. They have some pretty classy hitters in DiMaggio, George Selkirk, Charlie Keller, and a half a dozen others. And besides, didn't they win the pennant hands down without him? Well, yes. But then his old friends miss Lou, and if you ask them, they'll tell you so. They hate to see any old-timer pass out of the picture. Gehrig, as you know, is suffering from a rare disease. The doctors say that he can be cured, but that he will never play ball again. He's still on the Yankee active player list and will remain on the payroll until the end of the season. After that, he may be used in some executive capacity with the club, although nobody wants to comment on that right now. Anyway, perhaps the highest tribute ever paid to Gehrig was by Clark Griffith, the owner of the Washington Senators. Griffith never had much love for the Yankees, as you may know, but once when he was asked to name an all-time all-star team, he reeled off a list of names and wound up with, and I'll take Gehrig. He's reliable. Now, I have a real sporting proposition for all you fans who drive a car. I want you to listen to two or three safety slogans, and then for safety's sake, to do all in your power to live up to them. Here they are. Lose a minute and save a life. Children should be seen and not hurt. Step on your speed, urge, instead of your gas pedal. Yes, safety like charity begins at home. When motorists make up their minds to do just a little bit more than is demanded of them, our streets and highways will be safer for everyone. An extra driving courtesy in accident prevention comes well-conditioned equipment. Last year, unsafe tires were responsible for thousands of dangerous skids. With driving speeds what they are, with smooth oil-filmed roads, with today's heavy traffic, it just doesn't pay to ride around on anything but the safest tires. So have your car equipped with Goodrich Safety Silvertowns. No other tire gives you lifesaver tread skid protection. And no other tire gives you golden fire blowout protection. For unsurpassed tire safety, for honest tire economy, have your nearest Goodrich Silvertown tire dealer equip your car with Silvertowns. The Chicago Bears are monopolizing the ground-gaining brackets of the National Football League standings. The first standing, standings issued today show three Bears at the top of the heap. Little Bob Swisher, the Bears halfback, handed everyone a surprise when he knocked off 85 yards in eight attempts. Joe Manisi gained 84 yards and 14 tries. The freshman honors for the opening week of play was snagged by Bill Osmanski, who ticked off 64 yards in 10 dashes. Passing efficiency standings also showed a Chicago and tied for top honors. Bernie Masterson completed six of 11 passes to rival Arnie Herber of the Green Bay Packers. However, Herber bested Masterson in yardage on passes by a margin of 138 yards to 129. Pass receivers were topped by Bob McChesney of Washington, who caught four. Bill Smith of Chicago's Cardinals gained 83 yards on passes to lead that category. Smith also piled up 17 points to top the scorers. Ralph Kirchival of Brooklyn, Jack Manders of the Bears, and Smith each kicked a field goal. Alfred Gwynn Vanderbilt has invited three great horses to settle the American three-year-old championship at a mile and three-sixteenths in the third Pimlico special on November the 1st. Freshly embossed cards are in the mail addressed to Chaladon, Johnstown, and 8.30. They've been selected from a list of five horses nominated by turf riders in a national poll. Directors of the Maryland Jockey Club say that the three were named for these reasons. First, although C.S. Howard's Kayak II and T.B. Martin's Cravat also were nominated by the riders, Chaladon, Johnstown, and 8.30 led the poll. Second, Kayak II and Cravat are four-year-olds and so are ineligible to, for the three-year-old title. Last year in the great race, Seabiscuit, Humboldt, War Admiral. Gene Ostifer 
St. John's High School coach has been named coach of the Washington President professional football team. His appointment was announced today after Dick Nelson, former Maryland University star, was forced to turn down the coaching job. The Brooklyn Dodgers are on top of the National League football heap today. They are the only two-game winners of the infant season. Last night, they handed the Cleveland Rams their second straight setback, 23-12, to before 12,000 fans at Ebbets Field. Jack Dempsey, former heavyweight boxing champion, is going to referee at the boxing show presented by the Washington Society for the Blind. He has volunteered to referee the five-round feature between Tony Novak, national amateur heavyweight champion, and Jimmy Dackard, district Golden Gloves champion. The boxing carnival will be presented at Griffith Stadium on Friday night, October the 11th. That's all for tonight. Thanks for listening, and so long. Be sure to listen in again tomorrow night, same time, same station, for another Sports Review with Harry McTighe. And in the meantime, replace those worn, unsafe tires with good, rich, safety silver tons with Lifesaver Tread Skid protection and Golden Fly Blower protection. Stop in at your nearest Goodrich dealer or Goodrich Silverton store. They offer you your choice of three ways to buy. You can pay cash, open a liberal 30-day charge account, or make your own long, easy budget terms. <laughs>
The service for that, the service fee for that is $20 per four-hour program. If you need information about either of these uh, custom recording services, just give us a call here at our studio at 545-2260. Remember Henry Ford's Model T? Remember cranking up the motor to start the car? And remember the Model A with the self-starter? Great memories, huh? Well, Ralph Hirschberg of Nelson Hirschberg Ford has fond memories, too. Memories that roll back to 1931, when he and Norm Nelson first started selling Fords on Irving Park Road. Today, Ralph and Jurgen and all the folks at Nelson Hirschberg Ford remember one other thing, that during all those years, the Ford owner who comes again to get his new Ford from Nelson Hirschberg is the Ford owner who's been treated with old-fashioned respect and courtesy. Not only when he buys that new Ford, but while he owns it, too. Thousands of Ford owners come back again and again to do business with Nelson Hirschberg, one of Chicagoland's oldest, most respected Ford dealers. Find out for yourself. Get your new Ford from an old-fashioned dealer. Visit Nelson Hirschberg Ford, 5133 Irving Park Road, five blocks west of Cicero at Laramie. This is WNIB in Chicago at FM 97. Fred McDonald, we have an Amos and Andy quarter hour broadcast uh, coming up now at 6 o'clock in Washington, D.C., and the sponsor was Campbell Soups. Now, most of people today, when they think of Amos and Andy, they think back to the, uh, really the situation, the half-hour situation comedy that Amos and Andy became in 1943 and thereafter. They think perhaps of even the television series, which was, of course, based on the radio situation comedy. But when Ra uh, Amos and Andy first came to radio uh, in 1928 at WMAQ in Chicago and then on the NBC network in 1929, it was really a 15-minute serialized comedy program uh, featuring, of course, Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. And what we're hearing this, uh, this afternoon is a typical 15-minute uh, installment in the serialized story of the more or less the adventures of Amos and Andy and all of their uh, their cohorts. It is not the situation comedy that it, it later became. That wouldn't happen until 1943. And there was no studio audience at this time either. No. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, almost all the voices are. In fact, all the voices are done mm -hmm. by Freeman Gosden and Charles Carell. Okay. One thing to notice about this is that uh, it must be very embarrassing. Here, the uh, National Archives is recording this whole broadcast day for posterity, and now for the second time in the broadcast day, they're having technical difficulties. And so, for about two minutes or so into the uh, at the beginning of the program, they cannot get the show. And hmm. so we we have a, an organ, a musical interlude again, and then we pick up the show. So let's go back now to 1939 for um, radio's all-time favorites, coming up in about two minutes, <laughs> Amos and Andy. Ladies and gentlemen, technical difficulties beyond our control are delaying our presentation of the Campbell Soup Show, Amos and Andy, scheduled to be heard at this time. As soon as these difficulties have been cleared, we hope to present Amos and Andy. In the meantime, a transcribed organ interlude.
Ladies and gentlemen, the difficulties which delayed our presentation of Amos and Andy, sponsored by the makers of Campbell Soups, have now been cleared. Here are the famous pair, Amos and Andy. And the next thing, I sort of forgot some of the words to the song I was going to sing. Yeah. Couldn't get them in my head. Yeah. And you know that Mrs. Van Poulter and myself ain't speaking to each other, and we were supposed to sing together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then a little thing like, uh, well, this didn't mount to nothing, but I started thinking about getting up in front of all them people and something going wrong. Oh, now, that's it right there. Now, now, you don't... You don't beat around the bush, you don't finally got in there where the rabbit is. Yeah. Well, what's that? What? Yeah, well, that is, uh, that, that, that thing you're talking about, that is the germ that starts the whole fever, that fear germ. Oh, I wasn't scared. You think you was, and you were so nervous that all the nerves in your throat got together and say, let's tighten up on him. That's what your nerves say. Well, I've been over and talked to my singing teacher. Hmm. I told her that I was better now. Yeah. Then she told me that she was going to have to recycle next week. Oh, you was over there early this morning. Yeah, you told me that. Yeah. Oh, I in great shape. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Come, come, I love you only. Oh, boy, I really wish the thing was tonight. Yeah, you really wish the thing was over and that you was a big success. That's what you really wish. No, no. I tell you, I know that I'm going to be a success. Mm-hmm. I know that the newspapers is all going to be there to hear me sing. Well, now, listen, and I didn't want to show you this, but here's a little piece that was in the newspaper today. Uh, what's that? Look here, I'll read it to you. The Bluebird School of Singing, which is managed by Mademoiselle Henrietta DeWitt, announced that the recital scheduled for tonight would be postponed until a later date due to illness of some of the participants. Yeah, well, that ain't bad. Now, listen to this. Andrew H. Brown contracted buck fever yesterday as, as the zero hour approached. Mm. However, it was reported in Harlem that he knocked himself out with his own singing at rehearsals. That's a fine thing. Residents of Harlem claim to have never heard Mr. Brown sing. Mm. That noise you have been hearing for the past two weeks, which resembles a cow was Mr. Brown rehearsing for his debut. Now, there's something. It is reported that Mrs. Henry Van Porter, one of our better singers in Harlem, flatly refused to have her voice humiliated by singing a duet with Brown. Better singers. <laughs> this, we believe, was the real cause of the postponement. Yeah, well, Although this writer called Mr. Brown on the phone yesterday for a statement, but found him unable to talk, much less sing. Mm. We are looking forward to the recital next week when it is hoped that the teacher will be able to drug Mr. Brown sufficiently to get him on stage. I let's the whole thing, and I'll sue the newspaper for assault, battery, and slander. Yeah, well, don't start suing newspaper now, because they print the news, and this is news. Yeah, but why has they got to stand up and say all that about me? Some little reporter that ain't got sense enough to come in out the rain write that stuff. Wait till the newspaper crickets hear me sing. Yeah, well, that's who wrote this. This fella is the music cricket on the paper. He is the one that's going to report after he hears you sing. Oh, he is. Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I better let bad enough alone. Yeah, I say you might as well. Don't forget, don't try to fight the newspaper. Remember, the pen is mightiest than the sword. Yeah, I'd rather get stuck with a pen, though. Yeah, well, he's sticking you with one now. Yeah, that's the way with these crickets. They can't do nothing themselves, and they find fault with everything everybody else do. Well, the man is paid to find out the news about singing, and he got to tell the truth because the public wants to know the latest news. My public. How can they be like that? I love them. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Here come Henry Van Porter. Yeah, I'm going to talk to him. Well, don't start an argument with him. Oh, he's on my side. Come in, Henry. Well, how is you today, Henry? Well, my charming friends, how is you? Mrs. Van Porter is home, and she's having a nervous breakdown. Oh, she is, huh? Well, what's the matter with her? Getting old? Oh, uh, wait a minute, Henry. I do not like that remark about Mrs. Van Porter. Well, you don't like her singing neither, do you? Well, her singing has nothing to do with the remark you made. I'll have you know, Andrew Brown, that she is a member of the younger set. 
All right, all right. Well, uh, what's the matter with it? Yeah, what is the matter? Well, it just seems that this singing that she's doing is getting on her nerves. Last night, she heard the news of the postponement, and it just messed up all of her plans. Yeah, well, then they had a bad throat here till they called the thing off. Yeah, I was sick as two horses there for a while. Yeah. Well, confidential and under your hat, Mrs. Van Porter went to a store here in town, and she got a new dress to take home on approval. She was going to take the dress back Saturday morning, and she had a hard time getting the dress out of the store. Oh, yeah, they won't let my wife take none out uh, unless they put one of them lead sinkers on it, and if you take the lead sinkers off, why, you got to keep the dress. Well, they had the little lead weights on the dress that Mrs. Van Porter borrowed. But she got some flowers to cover the lead. Oh, yeah, yeah, they do that. But now she can't use the dress for the recital, and of course she blames you for the whole thing, Andy. Well, you blame me for it, huh? Yeah, what's that? Well, first of all, she say that you are teacher's pet. Well, one thing, I paid that teacher $21. I ought to get a little petting for that. That's more than Mrs. Van Poole done paid. You know that teacher can't live on IOU. Well, boys, some things you know goes wrong and you can't do nothing about them. Well, I will be glad when this singing is over because it is about to drive me out of my own home. Well, don't forget we got to practice. People complaining about my singing. Well, yeah, and there's been some complaints, yeah. I have heard, come, come, I love you only till I'm about to jump out of a window. Well, I don't sing that much. I I vocalize. Hey, ee, I, oh, you, whoa. Yeah, well, that is the thing, Andy, that is that the fellas is talking about in the newspaper, you know. Mrs. Van Porter says that you will ruin her voice. Well, how about her ruining my voice? She got me deaf in one ear now, the side she sings on. Yeah, well, uh, tell me this. Uh, when do you think the recital is going to be? Well, Mrs. Van Porter talked to the teacher a while ago. And the teacher thought that she would tell everybody but the singers a little ahead of time and not tell them till a few minutes before the recital happens so that they won't have time to get scared. Scared? I ain't scared, I'll tell you that. I'll sing in front of anybody. Be very funny if you see me in Carnegie Hall. I think they got a janitor, Andrew. All right, all right. Be funny now. Be funny. I'll show you. Uh, wait a minute. Come in, son. Well, hello there. What y'all doing in hello, here? Hello, Amos. Yeah, well, we just talking to Andy here, brother Amos. Uh, Andy claims that uh, after all, uh, the reason his throat closed up on him and all that stuff, that uh, he claims that he didn't have the buck fever, and that wasn't the trouble with his throat. Yeah, well, don't think that I got the buck fever. Yeah, well, I, the reason I come over here, I just uh, talked to your singing teacher just a minute ago. I just left there. And she says that she is going ahead with the recital tonight, and Andy, you has got to sing. Well, that's news. Yeah, well, going ahead with it, huh, Amos? Uh, well, what do you think? What do you think of it, Andy? Well, I'll do the best I can. Uh, no, no, that's all right. <laughs> Take it easy. I was just fooling. Yeah. Now there's a fella that's really got a throat, ain't it? Yeah, them buck fever germs is just laying in your throat there, waiting to hear something. Come on, son, unlax yourself. I was just kidding. To many, many families, soup means Campbell's tomato soup. So if it's a favorite at your house, too, won't you plan to have it again soon? And may I remind you that many people enjoy Campbell's tomato soup served as a tangy sauce. It's condensed, you know, double strength and double rich in keen tomato flavor, so it's ready to serve. Just heat it as it comes from the can and pour it over meatloaf, croquettes, or leftovers. It gives them a zippy tomato flavor men and youngsters both like. Many women keep extra cans of Campbell's tomato soup on hand to serve as a sauce as well as a soup. Don't you want to put it on your grocery list now? <laughs>
Dennis and Andy in person will return to you tomorrow at this same hour. This is Bill Hay speaking for Campbell's Tomato Soup, bidding you all good night. Tomorrow, meet the day with a sunny glass of tomato juice. But make sure it's Campbell's. Campbell's canning process retains the fresh tomato flavor that never varies can to can. Tomorrow, turn to Campbell's tomato juice. A better drink at breakfast, a grand drink anytime. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. And that's Amos and Andy from uh, 6 o'clock to 6.15 on uh, September 21st of 1939. This is Chuck Shaden on WNIB Chicago, FM 97, just 40 years later. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. Northwest Federal has more time for you. More hours, more convenience, and right now, more gifts for savers. Choose from a terrific selection of quality Samsonite luggage at special low prices. Or pick a genuine leather Buxton accessory freer at greatly reduced prices. Just deposit $100 or more at any Northwest Federal location. You can choose Samsonite hard side or soft side luggage. Cordova soft side flexes for easy packing, and Montbello II hard side keeps its tough molded shape. Or take a beautifully crafted Buxton leather accessory. But hurry, while the selection is best, one gift per family. Stop by any Northwest Federal Savings Center and see the selection. It's just one more example of how Northwest Federal does more for you. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time. We've got more time for you. Well, Fred McDonald, we're rapidly running out of time, and we still have one last quarter-hour program on our uh, broadcast day for this afternoon. This is the Parker family. The Parker family is sort of a nice, homey little 15-minute uh, weekly drama that is uh, what reminds one something of... Uh, uh, one man's family without the serialized story. It's just a, a little family drama that fits in nicely between Amos and Andy and uh, a big time programming such as the Joey Brown show as you'll be leading off with next week which follows uh, the Parker family. It began in 1939 on CBS and didn't make a particularly uh, auspicious appearance and uh, didn't last very long but it's uh, an interesting example of, a, of radio's ability to create short dramas and uh, entertainingly so. This was a, would be a, kind of a very late, late afternoon, uh, early evening soap opera because it was sponsored by Woodbury's Facial Soap. Well, it's not really a soap opera. It's not a serialized story. It's a, it's a complete little episode uh, that uh, in, in this particular one deals uh, in a somewhat innocent way with the theme of divorce. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's go back then to 1939 for the Parker family. WJSB, Washington. Woodbury presents The Parker Family, starring Leon Janney. The makers of Woodbury Facial Soap, the beauty soap for a skin you love to touch, Again, bring you a story in the life of the Parker family entitled The Dangerous Age with Leon Janney as Richard Parker, nicknamed Richard the Great. Richard himself will begin our story tonight after a brief word from our Woodbury beauty consultant. About this time of day, does your face look a bit fatigued? Well, it's no wonder that your skin gets a little tired and drab after you've been busy the whole live long day. If you're going out tonight, take a Woodbury facial cocktail first. Just smooth on a rich lather of Woodbury facial soap. Massage it in gently and then rinse. Doesn't that sound easy? Lovely debutantes give their complexions this beauty cocktail with Woodbury every afternoon before the evening starts. It only takes a moment and almost instantly revives that fresh, glowing look in your complexion. You see, Woodbury facial soap is made of soothing oils that contain a skin-invigorating vitamin. This vitamin definitely helps arouse the tired skin's vitality. Now, I'm sure you've been meaning to try Woodbury for a long time. Then don't put it off. Get Woodbury today and see how quickly your complexion improves under its skin-enlivening care. 
Woodbury is now only 10 cents, wherever fine toilet soap is sold. And don't miss the special offer to be announced later in the program. And now here's Leon Janney as Richard the Great. <laughs> you know, the way things happen to me, I sometimes wish I'd lived a long time ago instead of now. Things were different then. A little simpler, I guess I mean. And, and there were a lot of things you didn't have to worry about. Now, now take divorce, for instance. Something happened one day in my family that just about floored me. And finally, I decided to talk to my sister Nancy about it. I went up to her room that night and I said... Come in. I want to talk with you, Nancy. For goodness sake, Richard, where is the body? Huh? What body? You sound as if you had it buried somewhere. Oh, no, this is serious, Nancy. Well, sit down. Oh, not on the bed, Richard, please. You must sit all up. Sit over there, why don't you? You won't mind if I finish doing my nails. I've been trying to get at it all day. Nancy, what do you think of divorce? Divorce? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it isn't funny, either. I don't know, Richard. Well, you'll soon have to make up your mind. I'll tell you that. What are you talking about? Mom and Dad are going to get a divorce. Richard, you're crazy. Oh, no, I'm not. Say, where were you this afternoon? My mother asked me to go out to Prescott's farm to get the butter and eggs. Well, listen. I came home from school early today, and, and when I opened the front door, I heard Mom talking to somebody in the living room. I was just going in there when I... When I heard something, it just about knocked me over. You mean Mother was talking to a man? Sure. And it was somebody she knew before she was married to Dad because she said something about stuff that happened when they were kids. Richard, just because some old friend of Mother's drops in to see her... You wait till you hear the rest of it. The man said, I'll never forget how jealous Walter was. And then Mom kind of laughed. Was that all? No, it wasn't. The man said, I never thought I'd come to this, calling on a woman behind her husband's back. Now, do you believe me, Nancy? Well, I... Oh, what do you think she said then? She said, you'd better go before Richard comes home from school. I don't want him to know you were here, and he'd be sure to tell Walter. Richard? Well, she did. And then he said he'd drop in to see Dad tomorrow and pretend he just got into town. I... <laughs> How do you like that? I, I don't know what to think. Well, I do. I think Mother's at the dangerous age. You know, like that picture we saw the other night. Oh. Well, she's still kind of young, isn't she? And... And you know yourself, Dad never sends her flowers or, or anything. Oh, don't be silly. Dad's crazy about Mother. Now, listen, Richard. If I were you, I wouldn't say a word about this to anybody. Well, I'm certainly not going to just sit around while the family falls to pieces. I'm going to do something. What, for instance? Well, I don't know exactly, but... Oh, gee, Nancy, I thought you'd help me think of something. We can't say anything unless Mother does, Richard. We're not supposed to know it. She didn't say anything to you about that guy, did she? No, she didn't. There, you see? Well, I'll tell you this much, Nancy. You can sit there and not say anything if you want to. But if I can think of something to do, I'm going to do it. Well, hello, Richard. Hiya, Dad. Uh... Can I see you for a minute? Why, well, yes, yes. Uh, Miss Fenton, uh, get the plans of the Austin house and bring them in to me in about ten minutes, with you? Uh, come in, son. Come in. No football practice this afternoon? Oh, oh, I... I got through early, you see. Oh. I, I was... Well, I thought I might hmm, kind of wait around and go home with you. All right. I won't be leaving for an hour or more, though. Uh, is that all you want to see me about? Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh... Well, I thought we might stop at the florist on the way home and take Mother some flowers. Uh, you might take them, I mean. What's that? Yeah. It's not some kind of an anniversary, is it? Uh-uh. I just thought if you if you got her a corsage and maybe took her out dancing somewhere tonight, it, it might kind of, well, break the monotony. Say, what's got into you anyway, Richard? Hmm? What do you think we are, a couple of jitterbugs or whatever you call them? Oh, of course not. But I'll, I'll bet Mother would get a big kick out of going someplace to dance. Yeah. Why don't you ask her to uh, tonight? Well, did she say anything to you about this nonsense? Oh, no, Dad. You know how Mother is. But but do you realize that, that you and she are, are at the dangerous age? What? <laughs> what age is that? Well, the, the age where, where if you 
kind of take each other for granted? Well, well somebody else might come along or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, I saw a movie just the oh, other night. Where two... Oh, I see. I thought it was funny you'd stop in just to walk home from the office with me. Well, you can't blame me for not yeah, wanting you to you let your mother and me worry about that, will you, Richard? I'm pretty busy this afternoon. You'd better go on home, hmm? Well, okay, if you say so, Dad. I, I only hope you don't wake up someday and find out it's too late. Oh, Helen. I'm in the kitchen, Walter. Well, come in here, will you? Just a minute. I'm broiling chops and they have to be watched. What is it, Walter? Uh, can't Nancy tend to them? Mm, yeah, why, yes. Uh, Nancy, don't let the chops burn, dear. I'll be there in a minute. All right, Mother. Uh, Helen, mm -hmm. do you know what Richard's got in his head now? Oh, I know. He's been up in his room ever since he came home. He stopped into the office this afternoon, all full of some notion about you and I needing to go to a dance tonight for a change. What? What's he driving at? Well, I haven't the faintest idea. Sends if I didn't start bringing home flowers for you to wear, I'd wake up someday and find out it was too late. <laughs> Good heavens. <laughs> you aren't sick, are you, Helen? He, he didn't mean that, did he? Oh, certainly not, Walter. <laughs> the way he talked, I, I was just about ready to believe you had an old bow on the street. Hmm? But he didn't know I... Oh, dear, I... That would be funny, wouldn't it? Hey, what's the matter with you, Helen? Nothing, Walter, nothing. I, I've got to get back and see about dinner. No, no, wait a minute. Hmm? Nancy knows how to get dinner. You just said that Richard didn't know something. What was it? Nothing that amounts to anything, Walter. My goodness, the way you're acting, you'd you'd think I'd rob the bank. Well, what about the way you're acting? Hmm? You're trying to keep something from me, and I want to know what it is. I'm not going to stand here and be cross-examined like a, a criminal, Walter Parker. Why, Helen. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, dear. I, I didn't mean to lose my temper. It's only that I... Mother, huh? I guess I might as well give you this letter. Oh, thank you, Richard. Oh. It was in the mailbox when I came home. I thought at first I wouldn't give it to you, but then I realized that wouldn't be right. It's from somebody that's staying at at the hotel. Yes, I I see it is, Richard. Well, I I can't stand here talking any longer. Aren't you going to open the letter, Mother? No, dear, not now. I, I'll read it later. Oh, I suppose you already know what's in it, do you? Why, yes, Walter. But, yes, I do. So there was something in all that Tommy Rod Richard was giving me. Mother, Dad, come on to dinner. Everything's on the table. There'll be no dinner eaten in this house tonight until I get to the bottom of this. Oh, Richard, I told you but, not to say anything. So it. you're in it too, Nancy. Oh, we are not, Dad. Nancy and I don't know a thing about it, except that, that that fella came here yesterday Richard, and I don't think... You don't know what you're talking about. Oh, gosh, Mom, you don't realize what it means to have your father and mother get a divorce. What? Divorce? <laughs> Helen, who is this fellow that's been coming around here behind my back? That's just what he said, Dad. Who said? The father. Helen, will you tell me who this man is? Oh, I, I might have known I couldn't keep anything from you. Every time I'd try to plan a surprise, it all... Oh, come. Mom, now, please don't oh, cry. Oh, why couldn't you keep still, Richard? Oh. I knew something like this would happen. Oh, never mind, Nancy. It's all right. I don't know how you found out about Harry, Richard, but... Harry who? Harry Minnick. What? You know him, Walter. Uh, Harry Minnick hasn't been in this town for 15 years. Have you been writing to him I'm all this time? I'm trying to tell you. You know, he was with that book publishing company for so long. Yes? Well, they finally went out of business, and poor Harry was out of a job. So he went to work as a book salesman. He travels around the country and takes orders. But, from Mom, him. he certainly wasn't talking about books to you yesterday. I heard you tell him he'd better go away before I got home, because I'd tell Dad he was here. Did you, Helen? Of course I did. Well, well that's a fine how do you do. Well, don't you see, Walter? When we had all that trouble about Eleanor Murray's birthday present last Sunday, I decided I'd get your birthday present early this year. So, when Harry called me up, I had him come over, and I ordered that set of technical books you've been talking about for the last year. What? Well, that's all there is to it, and you've spoiled my surprise for nothing. And that letter I just got is a copy of the order. He said he'd mail it to me, and he did. Well, <laughs> doesn't seem very funny to me. <laughs> I'm sorry, Helen, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's too bad to spoil your surprise. Well, but the idea of me letting Richard stir me all up over a man coming to see you, and then it turns out that he's a book agent, and old Harry Minnick at that. <laughs> The idea. The idea of two people of our age quarreling over another man anyway. <laughs> 
it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> you know, you really had me scared, Helen. You know what I'm going to do tonight after dinner? There's no telling. I'm going down and see that picture Richard was talking about. What? See, if you're getting to the dangerous age, I want to see what I'm up against. Well, maybe I'd better go with you. You might be getting to that age yourself, and I'd hate to go through all this again. Colonel Jumpin' Cat, so would I. <laughs> <laughs> huh. How do you like that? <laughs> In just a moment, Leon Johnny will be back to tell you about next week's story. But first, a word from Woodbury. Girls, which beauty soap would you say is the finest for the skin? Millions of you will reply, Woodbury Facial Soap, and right you are. For generations, the famous name Woodbury has stood for purity and gentle care of the skin. And today, Woodbury Facial Soap has this added benefit, a skin invigorating vitamin which actually enlivens the skin's vitality. Just as Woodbury was the favorite of society bells in years gone by, it's the beauty cocktail of glamorous debutantes today. Try a Woodbury facial cocktail yourself. Whip up a rich lather, rub it generously over your face and neck, then rinse and see how bright and fresh your skin looks afterwards. Now, we'll send you a guest cake of fragrant Woodbury in a five-piece weekend beauty kit if you write for it today. This attractive kit brings you also Woodbury powder in eight glamorous shades. Woodbury Beauty Creams and a Blush Rose Lipstick, a complete assortment of Woodbury Complexion and Makeup Aid. And it's so easy to get. Just mail 10 cents with your name and address to Woodbury, Box 31, Cincinnati, Ohio. Send for it right away. Now, Richard the Great, what's the name of the story for next week? Well, it's called Business Today. You know, you're always hearing about how business is going to depend on the coming generation in a few years and all that stuff. Well, I took a little flyer in business myself. Yeah, you'll be as surprised as I was at the way it turned out if, if you listen in next Thursday night. <laughs> Good night. The Parker family has been brought to you by the makers of Woodbury Facial Soap, the beauty soap for a skin you love to touch. Harry Clark speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Six thirty PM B U L O V A Boulevard Watch Time. Courtesy of the Boulevard Watch Company, 5th Avenue, New York. WJSV, Washington. And that just about wraps up this uh, sequence of shows from this segment of the complete broadcast day from September 21st of 1939. This afternoon we've tuned into a baseball game and some musical interludes, news, sports news, Amos and Andy and the Parker family. The segment of the WJSV programming from 4 o'clock in the afternoon until 6.30. Now, if you'll join us next Saturday afternoon at 1 here on WNIB, we'll pick up the evening primetime programming from 6.30 until 9.30. We'll have the Joey Brown Show, a quiz show, Ask It Basket, Strange As It Seems, Elmer Davis and Commentary, the Major Bowes Original Amateur Hour, and the Columbia Workshop production of Now It's Summer starring Carl Swenson and Ann Shepherds. Our thanks to Fred McDonald for joining us all these last several weeks. Fred's not going to be able to be with us for the next two Saturdays, but we sure uh, appreciate his being here, and we thank you very much, Fred, for joining us. That's it for now. The old clock on the wall says it's time for us to go. We'll be back next Saturday from 1 to 5 with more nostalgic sounds. Our thanks to Mort Paradise, Dennis Bubaz, Joel Bogart, and Gary Schroeder for their help behind the scenes. To our sponsors, Northwest Federal Savings, Nelson Hirschberg Ford, and Eden's Plaza Shopping Center for making this weekly get-together possible. And to you out there in Radio Land for making it worthwhile. This is Chuck Shaden speaking. Have a nice weekend. We'll see you in the memory movie tonight at Northwest Federal Savings for the double feature, Blondie's Lucky Day plus Ellery Queen, Master Detective. 
Thanks for listening. This is WNIB in Chicago at 97 FM. Are you ready to stand amidst the most magnificent mountains in the world or ride a snowmobile over ancient ice fields or go rafting down the gushing Bow River? Then you're ready for Alberta, Canada. Starting June 15th, Air Canada makes it easy to get there with our all-new one-stop service to Edmonton, gateway to the wonders of Alberta. So just take it easy, we'll make it easy, take the easy way up, take Air Canada. Just call your travel agent or Air Canada. Now it's coming up on a minute past 5 p.m. in Chicago, and this is Bruce Duffy welcoming you once again to Zephyr. Zephyr is a two-hour program of short, familiar classical music, which we present every evening, beginning around 5 o'clock. In the first hour of tonight's program, we have the Liszt First Piano Concerto, then an overture by Franz von Suppe, and then some lighter music of Heuberger, Chrysler, and Johann Strauss, Jr. Then in the second hour, beginning at about 6 p.m., we will hear the Chicago Symphony under Claudio Abado playing music of Serge Prokofiev, also music of Skriabin for piano, a nocturne by Tchaikovsky, and music of Rachmaninoff, Stravinsky, Kachaturian, and Shostakovich. To begin, we have some music of Franz Liszt. We're going to hear his concerto number one in E-flat major for piano and orchestra. In this recently reissued Deutsche Grammophon Privilege recording, the pianist is Thomas Vachary. He's heard with the Bamberg Symphony Orchestra, conducted by...